Blog Talk Radio. Me chiamo apura kanu apurai taiku. Ne ye egua da me dinde ujira po kwezi rane mpata akan. Akwamu mai na maruka e tipi mu ujira po. Ujira mai mu. Greetings to all apura kani apurai kaini people, meaning Africans, black people today. It's Egua Day, Marketplace Day. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Rane Mbata Akan. Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojirama, the purified nation, Apurakani, Apuraikaitni people in the Western Hemisphere. Get out there. We thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. We've opened up the chat room. If you have a question or a comment in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. You can sign up for a username and blog talk quickly if you do not have a username. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. Uh, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akan Fo Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion, on Joda on Monday nights, where we deal ex- exclusively and specifically with the Akan expression of Nanasom or ancestral religion, first and foremost because we are Akan, secondly because of the misinformation that has been put forward by individuals in this hemisphere as well as on the continent who have been misinformed and infected by white pseudo-religion, pseudo-philosophy, and so forth. Therefore, their presentation of Akan ancestral religious practice and philosophy and cosmology has been infected. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion, which takes us through our ancestral practices and expression from ancient Kana, which is a title of Nubia, the Khan land, Akan land. Some of our people migrated from ancient Kana, reestablished the Kana empire in the western part of the continent after the fall of Kemet 2,000 years ago. We reestablished the Akana or Kana empire thousand years later, because of Muslim invasion, some of our people migrated further south towards the forest belt and savannah region in the regions of contemporary Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and the Republic of Ghana, reestablished Akan culture. And then hundreds of years after that, some of our people were taken from those regions and forced into the Western Hemisphere during the Musuwa Ketie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. And this is how some of our people ended up in North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe. We maintain Akan ancestral religion within our blood circles even through this forced migration. And thus we have the Akan ancestral religion as Winti in Suriname in South America, Obeya in Jamaica, and Akan ancestral religion is Hudu in North America, which is from the Akan term Undu, which means medicine from roots, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession and conjure and so forth. So we deal specifically with Akan Po Nanasom, ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion on Joda Monday nights. On Benada, Abenada Tuesday nights, we have Ojira, which means purification. We deal with ancestral religion in general, not just the Akan expression, but ancestral religion in general, which we call Nanasom, as it impacts every aspect of our lives, is Afurakani, Afurakani people. When we deal with ancestral religion, in essence, it is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine vow. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law, incorporating order, and through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and re- realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We say that ojira, purification, operationalizes nanasong. Purification operationalizes our practice of ancestral religion, the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. This is what empowers our culture, our way of life, our amamre. Our culture is Afurakani, Afurakani people, is to execute our divine function in creation. We are aligning every thought, every intention, and every action, every moment of every day 
with divine order so that we can execute our function in creation harmoniously. When we make legitimate mistakes, then we engage the ritual process to incorporate divine law and restore divine balance so that we can realign ourselves with order and get back on track to executing our divine function every moment of every day. So this is how ancestor religion impacts every aspect of our lives every moment of every day. So we purify concepts, purify cosmology, purify the understanding of ritual practice and so forth and its ramifications for every aspect of our lives. This is what we deal with on Ojeda, on Benanda, Abenanda Tuesday nights, on Yauda Thursday nights, which is also Yada and Abada, we have Amain Sim, Affairs of the Nation. We're dealing with issues that affect the Afura Kani Afura Kani Nation in general, but Ojira Amain, the purified nation, Afura Kani Afura Kani people in the Western Hemisphere in particular. Since we were forced into the Western Hemisphere, some of our people who maintained our ancestral religious practices or have been restoring them, we, we are drawn together guided by our ancestresses and ancestors and have coalesced in a specific region of the Earth mother, Mother's body here in the Western Hemisphere. We've blended ancestral blood circles over generations. We have dealt with and, and interfaced with this unique expression, manifestation of the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, the Ntoru, Ntoru to the divinity in this region of the Earth Mother, incorporated that unique expression of their dispensation of energy into our bodies, We've dealt with the plant life, animal life, mineral life in this region of the Earth Mother's body while interfacing with her and blending blood circles. So we have forged a locative identity in this region of the Earth Mother's body through the blending of ancestral blood circles and interfacing with the Abosom, the divinities here. So Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, we designate Ojira Mind, the purified Ojira Omain nation, mine in the land of the setting sun, the West. We have a unique identity and we need to approach our issues from an Amanie or nationist perspective. When we talk about nation or Omain, we're talking about a living, breathing entity governed by specific Abosom, Orisha, Vodou, and we are cells within that entity, just like cells within an organ, and we operate in harmony with one another, operate, operate in harmony with the living, breathing entity, the organ of which we are component part, and the divinities, the Orisha, the Vodou, the Abosom who govern that organ of structure. But we have a nationist perspective. Amanie nationism is the purification of nationalism. So this is what we deal with on Amain Simda, Affairs of the Nation, day on that broadcast on Yauda Thursday night. Tonight is Awukuda, also Akuada, which means Wednesday. We have Egua, which means Marketplace. We showcase Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community, and um, in their context of service, they are informed by their ancestral religious practices and values. We showcase a number of businesses, and we will have more businesses, organizations, and institutions coming onto the show. We also talk about the cosmological foundation for our approach to economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values on this show. We have published our Okom Economic Development Model, which is a model rooted in our ancestral religious values, a holistic approach to economic development, which is an engine towards and a major component of online sesu or nation building. So these are the kinds of subjects we deal with on Egua Marketplace Day. One uh, particular angle of this, that cosmological angle of this, is what we're going to deal with tonight. So we have our link, which you see, which we'll place in the chat room, the article that we're going to go over. One of the articles, we have two articles we're going to go over. The first one, and we're placing the link in the chat room right now. When you go to our OG.sim um, blog page on WordPress, you will find this article. And the name of the article is APEP, the Waste Processing Function of the Sacred Serpent in the Underworld. Now, the image that you see, the two images that you see that heading the article, on one hand, on the, of course, on the left-hand side is the, you know, the uh, large intestine and small intestine. 
and you'll see the transverse colon and the descending and ascending colon and so forth and the small intestine on the inside. And then on the right, you see one of the images from the Shat Imduat, the book of what is in the underworld, and you'll see the serpent with the many folds in his body, that is Apep, and you see the divinity Atem standing by the serpent, monitoring and controlling that serpent's function in the underworld. So we want to get into this notion of who is Apep, what is his function as a divinity, and what this has to do with us as a people, how we function in creation, also dealing with our, the nature of the manner in which we consume our consumption habits, processes, and the best means by which we need to approach that. Now, the first thing we do, we have a, a quote from one of the ancient texts from ancient Kemet, and what it says, quote, is get back a pet, you enemy of Ra, you winding serpent in the form of an intestine. This is from the Pert Imheru, so-called Book of the Dead. You winding serpent in the form of, of an intestine, without arms and without legs. Your body cannot stand upright so that you may have therein being. Long is your tail in front of your den, you enemy. Retreat before Ra. Your head will be cut off and the slaughter of you will be carried out. You will not lift up your face, for his, meaning Ra's, flame is in your spirit. The odor which is in his chamber of slaughter is in your members, and your form will be overthrown by the slaughtering knife of the great God. The spell of the scorpion divinity goddess Sedeket drives back your might. Stand still, stand still, and retreat through her spell. Now, Apep is the divinity we're talking about, and Ra, of course, is the creator of the universe. Ra'et is the creatress of the universe. Ra and Ra'et work together to create the universe. They are the, the great spirit of the supreme being. The supreme being is a, comprised of Amin and Aminet, called Nyame and Nyamewa in Akan, the great father and great mother. Well, two halves of the divine hold the supreme being. They direct Ra and Ra'et, who are called Nyonkumpon and Nyonkumpon in Akan, and Odumare, and Oshumare, and Yoruba, and Da, and Da, and Aida, Huedo, and Vodun. The supreme being, Amenet and Amen, direct their grandchildren, Ra and Ra'et, to create the universe. So the creator and creatress are the grandchildren of the supreme being. So we're talking about Apep here this force in nature, and we often hear about who is Apep, what is his function in creation, is he, a, is, is he the devil, is he the spirit? Of course, the White and Arrow Spring, when they're creating the fictional cartoon characters in the Bible, manufacturing these fake stories, they're taking names and titles of deities and, and stories from ancient Kemet, cosmological expressions, and corrupting them. Of course, the serpent, talking about the evil serpent and so forth, in the Bible is a corruption and conflation of the serpent Apep, but also they throw in the deity Set or Seti, also pronounced Suti and so forth, um, which Seti becomes corrupted into Setin and Satan and so forth and Shaitan. That's a corruption of the deity Set. Set is not the personification of evil as the whites and offspring would like to promote, but they don't understand the function of this divinity. They also included the iconography of the serpent, Apep, who would be seen attacking the boat of Ra in the underworld on a regular basis. So let's get into this information, these details. The Abosom, which means divinities in Akan, called Orisha in Yoruba, Vodou in the Ebian phone traditions, the Untoru or Untorutu, the deities in Kemet, misnomer Neteru and Netertu. The divinities, the Abosom, are the spirit forces in creation, are literally the divine organs within the great divine body of Amenet and Amen, the supreme being, Nyamewa Nyame, the great mother and great father who comprise the supreme being. Just as your organs are smaller bodies regulating order in the greater body, you, so are the Abosom, the deities, smaller divine beings, organs regulating divine order within the great being within creation. 
the divine body of Amenet Amen. One of those organs is the intestinal tract. The intestines process waste and expel waste from the body. This is a vital function. If this function is not carried out on a regular basis, throughout the course of your entire life, you will suffer. Chronic disorder within intestinal functioning can lead to death. In the process of extracting nutrients from digested foods and processing waste, parasites can take up a temporal residence within the intestinal tract. Some bacteria and fungi in the intestinal tract are parasitical to other bacteria and are beneficial to the body. Some bacteria and entities, including intestinal worms, tapeworms, etc., can be destructive if not isolated and expelled from the body. This hosting of beneficial bacteria and elimination of maleficent bacteria is an ongoing process which contributes to the stability of the individual. In the same fashion, the waste or disorder processing divine organ in the divine body is a pep. A pep is shown as a serpent with many folds in the underworld. Within his realm are many, quote unquote, negative spirits. The duat in ancient men is called the underworld, the spirit realm. When the sun sets in the west and the boat of Ra begins to move through the 12 hours of night in the underworld, and Ra takes the form, he goes from being a, uh, a falcon headed divinity to a land animal, a flat horned ram, and so forth, and he's called Afura. Afu means flesh, also house and place of residence. So Ra is moving within matter in the underworld, in the Afu, in the flesh, and so forth. He's called Afura. When he's moving through the underworld and seeing the different spirits that try to attack the boat of Ra and so forth and stop that divine living life force energy from moving through the underworld and so forth, this is what you see in the text and the murals and so forth. So we say within his realm, the realm of Apep, in the underworld, there are many negative spirits, bacteria, that attempt to attack the boat of Ra, the creator, as he sails through the underworld, the spirit world, the ancestral realm, during the 12 hours of the night. The beneficent bacteria and other organs, various, meaning various, non unknown insamampo, spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors, and the abosom, the deities, these are like the beneficent bacteria and other organs, work to keep the negative entities in check while furthering the holistic functioning of the divine living energy of Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress moving through the under or inner world. So as your life force energy is moving through your body, that's no different than the energy of Ra and Ra'et moving through the spirit realm. They're enlivening and empowering the ancestresses and ancestors who are living in harmony in the ancestral realm, but they're also repelling negative entities, including just in your body, negative bacteria, maleficent bacteria, and so forth. When one makes transition via death, the spirit separates from the body. And, and we show, by the way, that image of Ra sitting in his boat with the head of a falcon, sitting on his throne at the front of the boat, prow of the boat of Ra, you see Set, and he has a spear, and he's stabbing the serpent, Apep. And the serpent, Apep, with his folds are up under the boat of Ra. That's like the intestinal tract up in the, quote-unquote, underworld, in the lower portion of the uh, viscera and so forth. So you have, we wanted to show that, showing that Set is not the embodiment of disorder, or else he wouldn't be spearing Apep. He's actually defending Ra in the boat of Ra. Now, when one makes transition via death, the spirit separates from the body. The journey to the realm of our ancestresses and ancestors can be wrought with danger. There are negative, discarnate, deceased spirits of disorder who are transient and seek to control and manipulate, just as there are homeless, transient, individuals who harass people and may even attack, assault people who are walking down the street. So do disordered, transient spirits continue this process 
in the lower levels of the spirit realm after they die, transition from the physical world. So when we want to think about what's happening in the spirit realm, you consider what's happening in the physical world. We also consider what's happening in the spirit realm as akin to the dream state. So the dream state, and that's a saying in the Akan tradition, if you want to know what's happening in Asamando, the ancestral realm, consider the Adai or the dream state. When you're dreaming, your body is laying in a dark room, no movement, no light, no, no, nothing is going on, you can't see, you can't, nothing is going on for you to pay attention to or listen to. You're laying in a dark room, motionless, not seeing or hearing anything on the outside but your spirit is engaged in activity with other disembodied spirits. You're seeing colors, seeing entities, hearing, feeling, and so forth. If someone walked into the room, they would just see a motionless body in the dark. They're not experiencing what you're experiencing. What is the nature of these luminous entities that you're experiencing if your eyes are closed and there's darkness in the room? What's the nature of that luminosity and interfacing? When people say it's just in the mind, then you say, what is the mind? This is a disembodied energy force. Now, the same takes place when you transition. Your body's laying in the dark of the grave and so forth, but your spirit begins to interact with the ancestresses and ancestors, other discarnate spirits and so forth. Just like you have homeless individuals here walking around on earth, and they will harass people as they're walking down the street, Walking by them, they may be sitting on the ground and they lash out anybody, at anyone who walks by. When such an individual dies and their spirit separates from their body, if they were operating out of harmony with divine order on a consistent basis, they're in a lower level of the spirit realm. They are repelled from the region where our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors reside. No different than when they're physically alive, if they're on drugs, engaged in self-destructive, erratic behavior, and they tried to come and walk up in your house and sit there and lay there and, and reside there, you would repel them. They're not going to bring that criminality or perversity or discordant energy into your home. You're not going to allow that to dwell. With somebody in your family, you're going to give them the option to clean themselves up and go through some form of rehabilitation physically as well as spiritually, but if they're not engaging in that, you will repel them from your place of residence. They're not going to reside with you and bring that negativity to you. The same is true in the ancestral realm. Such spirits who have that discordant energy, they will be repelled from the region of the ancestral realm, Asamanda, where the ancestresses and ancestors of our spiritually cultivated family reside. So they're wayward and homeless just like they were physically. So when someone you make your transition and your spirit separates from your body, that journey to the region of the ancestral realm where your spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors reside can be wrought with because you can pass through a region where these wayward transient individuals are. And just like you had to pass through them going to work or going back home on your way home or way after work and so forth, and, of course, you can repel them and keep going, some of them are more aggressive. And if your immunity is weak, then you could be lured in by these individuals or assaulted by these individuals if you don't have some immunity, a way to defend yourself. Of course, we've talked about the Abosom who come forward, such as Het Heru, Nebet Amintet, the mistress of the West and so forth, the Nefert, the beautiful one, the first one you see is the beautiful one who manifests the help align you with your new condition, that emanation and exudation of that energy of nefer, of beauty coming from Het Heru, helps to adjust you to this new condition that you find yourself in after you've made transition from the physical world and now you're in the ancestral realm. She's the first face that you see and so forth. And you also have Akua, which is Nebet Het, and you have all seven and so forth, these different divinities. But you, you, have, you have some assistance when you've been living in harmony with order you garner that kind of assistance as well as assistance from your spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors who have been guiding you since you were living on earth. Now, when we transition, we talk about that we have the capacity to repel such spirits, these transient homeless type spirits who are in the lower levels of the ancestral realm who sometimes will try to block our passage to the 
realm of Asamando, where our ancestresses and ancestors reside. We have the capacity to repel such spirits, spirits through alignment with the Abosom, the deities who govern us, and the Nananom Nsamanfo, also called Aku and Akutu in ancient Kemet, the Egungun in the Yoruba tradition, Kuvito and Bodun, the spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors of our matric clans and patric clans. In the same manner, we have the capacity to beat down a transient individual in the physical world who attacks or assaults or harasses us as long as we keep our physical bodies strong and remain focused when defending ourselves. Ritual invocation of the Abosom and Nananom and Samanfo, the deities and ancestral spirits who are cultivated, allows us to repel negative spirits with ease and reconnect with our honorable deceased relatives in their region of the ancestral realm. One such invocation is quoted above from the ancient text, and that's the ritual prayer that we just read, talking about causing a pep to retreat. Now, when one views the world right side up, and when we talk about these prayers in the ancient commandment, you're reading these texts, these are ritual invocations. They're not just uh, prose or poetry. These are ritual invocations that are spoken that are chanted, that are sung. No different than the ritual songs and chants that we have in Hudu and Juju and Vodun and the various traditions. Now, when world, one views the world right side up with Afuraka, Afuraikai, or Africa in the center, the south on top, and the north on the bottom, we have a proper vantage point. The continent of Afuraka, Afuraikai, Africa, and of course we have our book, Afuraka, Afuraikai, the origin of the term Africa, where we are the first of any scholar, black or non-black, to prove that Afraka is the etymological and cosmological origin of the term Africa. And we show this in the book, of course, but right side up, it was the whites and offspring who decided to make north top and south bottom. They wanted Europe on the top, meaning superior, and Afraka, Afraka on the bottom. So they just flipped the globe around and started placing north on the top. We always recognize south to be on the top and north to be on the bottom. This is why in ancient Kemet, the word for right, as in the direction right, is amit, and it also means west. The word for left, being the left direction, is aptet, and it also means east. The only way the direction right can also be west and left can also be east is if you're facing the south. If you're facing the south, then on your right hand is the west, and your left, left hand is the east. If you're facing north, it's, re, it's reversed. So you can look in the language of ancient command, you can see that south was always on the top, the first, the foremost, the front, even the term resit, meaning south, also shows um, the medut or the hieroglyph of the head, the top of the head, the top of the head, but just a head in general, meaning the head land, the south land, the first land, the front land. Now, when you see the continent right side up, meaning the south is on the top and the north is on the bottom, then you have a proper vantage point. Now, here's the key. It's also in that proper orientation in the shape of the human heart. Just north of the human heart, meaning below the heart in the proper vantage point, is the largest organ in the body, which is the liver. And just north of or below the liver is the small intestine region. Similarly, just north or, or below, north of or below the continent of Afuraka, Afuraikai, is the largest landmass, which is Eurasia. Further north or below is northern Eurasia. This is the intestinal region of Asase Afua, the earth mother. So when you look at your organs with the heart, you look just below the heart. Which is, when you look at your head, your head is south, and then you look down towards your sacral region, the sacral kara kara or chakra region. And of course, we have our book off the origin of the term yoga, which includes the article kara kara, the origin and nature of the chakras show that the term kara kara in ancient Kemet is where they get the term kakra, meaning chakra in the east, 
And, of course, onk is the tor- origin of the term yonk or yonka, which became corrupted into yonk and yuga and yoga later on. So we proved that in our book. But your head is south, just like the term resit, meaning south, also has the picture of someone's head because that's the front land or the top land in the sacral region near your base. That's the north. So when you look at your heart, just north of your heart, which is just below your heart, is the largest organ in the body, which is the liver. And just north of the liver, further north, further down, is where the small intestinal region is. When you look on the planet Earth with the proper orientation, Afuraka, Afuraka is in the form of the human heart with the south on the top and the bulging region on the bottom. Just north of that, meaning just below that, is the largest landmass or the largest organ of Earth, which is Eurasia. And just north of that is northern Eurasia. Northern Eurasia is the intestinal region of Asasea for the Earth Mother. Northern Eurasia is the waste processing region of the planet. It is also the region wherein the whites and their offspring came into existence as a result of their spiritual and physical degeneration. Waste is eliminated from the body. This includes waste, which is a natural byproduct of digestion, as well as cancerous tumors and other cancerous cells, which manifest in the body as a result of disordered, unnatural behavior, activity, consumption, etc. The whites and their offspring are the cancerous cells within the communal body. They have a temporal existence until they are eradicated completely by the healthy, normal, Afurakani, Afurakani African cells of the immune and lymphatic divine organ systems within the great divine body. The whites and their offspring have only been on earth for a few thousand years. They have not always been here. They will not always be here. As cancerous cells, they seek to consume and destroy every healthy cell in their path just like cancerous cells metastasizing and moving throughout the body, seeking to consume and destroy. We have an immune and lymphatic system which destroys cancerous cells and expels them from the body for the maintenance of the integrity of your organism. The same is true within the great divine body of the supreme being. A cancerous formation has developed. It developed in northern Eurasia, in the intestinal region, the waste processing region began to metastasize and spread out throughout the different organs or continents of the body, the divine body of earth. The immune and lymphatic system cells with the support of the other cells within the great divine body, including Afurakani, Afurakani people who are children of those different divinities, will eradicate these cancerous cells. That is the solution to the quote-unquote race problem is the eradication of these cancerous cells. That is the only solution. Now, and that's the divine solution. We said we eliminate waste in the physical body through our pet. We also eliminate waste and negative spirits in the ancestral realm through recognizing the role of our pet and functioning accordingly. We eliminate waste in our own spirits by rejecting those thoughts, intentions, and actions which are disordered, allowing them to be disintegrated through ritual invocation of the Abosom and Nananom and Samapo, the deities and ancestral spirits who are honorable. Recognizing the role of our pep, we eliminate waste in our community by recognizing the role of our pep, the nature of the negative entities and cancerous entities, and neutralizing and eradicating them accordingly. The flame of Ra and Raya is referenced in the text as the power which denies Apep the ability to lift up his face, meaning to overstep his role, proliferation of negative bacteria, cancer cells. The intestinal tract is necessary. It carries the waste, processes the waste, and of course you want to push the waste out of the body, and also the negative cancerous entity. But if it oversteps its role and begins to proliferate in these negative bacteria, cancerous entities, then you can develop diseases which will eventually kill you. 
So you don't want it to overstep its role and become overactive or hyperactive and so forth. You want to maintain its functioning, its proper functioning, so that the body can maintain its function. So they talk about in the text the flame of Ra, which denies Apep the ability to lift up his face and over, overstep his role. What is that flame of Ra and Ra'at, which denies Apep that capacity to overstep his role? and keep him functioning the way he should be functioning. The invocation of the Abosom, the goddess Serket, the the scorpion goddess Serket, is referenced in the text as one whose spell drives back the might of Apep and causes him to stand still and retreat. And if we go back to that text, it says, talking to Apep, your head will be cut off, and the slaughter of you will be carried out. You will not lift up your face, for Ra's flame is in your spirit. The odor which is in his chamber of slaughter is in your members, and your form will be overthrown by the slaughtering knife of the great god. The spell of the scorpion goddess Serket drives back your might. Stand still, stand still, and retreat through her spell. Now, We talked about the flame of Ra. We're going to talk about what that flame is that doesn't allow Apep to overstep his his functioning, the boundaries of his functioning, and so forth. And then the spell of Sedeket, the scorpion Abosom. Sedeket, and we did an entire broadcast on Sedeket, the scorpion, female divinity. She governs the thorax, windpipe, and breathing apparatus. We show the image of Sedeket. We show the image of the rib cage and the sternum, and just under that is the thorax, the thoracic cavity. And you'll see that that scorpion, scorpion is sitting right on the chest, up under the sternum and rib cage, and so forth. That is uh, Sedeket sitting in her shrine within your body. She governs the windpipe and breathing apparatus, the thoracic cavity, and so forth. The breath in connection with the flame of Ra, Ra'et dwelling within the Afurakani, Afurakani people is the Ba, the Ba'et, the divine living energy that proceeds from Ra and Ra'et. The Ba, which is the male term, Ba'et, which is the female term, is the spirit, a portion of the divine living energy of Ra and Ra'et dwelling within us as Afurakani, Afurakani people. So just like you have a physical body and you have blood circulating throughout your physical body and there's heat energy within your physical body circulating within your body. You have a spirit body and what's filling that spirit body is that divine living energy from Ra and Ra. Of course, they use the sun and other stars to transmit their solar energy and divine living energy to the various planets, planet stars, black substance of space and so forth. So the Ba and the Ba'at is the divine living energy. Ra and Ra'at are the great spirit. They are the great Ba and the great Ba'at, the divine living energy, solar power, fire, operating within the great divine body, the black substance of space, and permeating all of creation. The great divine body of supreme being is animated by the great spirit, Ba and Ba'at, the great Ba and the great Ba'at, who is Ra and Ra'at, the creator and creatress. They are the great spirit or the great Ba and Ba'at within the great divine body, of the supreme being, bringing life and vitality and so forth. You have a portion, a drop of that divine living solar energy surging through your spirit body. You have a ba or a bayat animating you. You can direct that divine living energy, that ba or that bayat, to your arms, your legs, your reproductive organs to execute specific functions. You as a being can direct your divine living energy to serve you empower you, vitalize you, heal you, and so forth. Now, the Ba'an Ba'at, a spirit, is the spirit of portion of the divine living energy of the great Ba, the great Ba'at, who are called Ra'an Ra'at, the great Tor and great Tress, dwelling within us. It is depicted, the Ba or the Ba'at is depicted as a human-headed bird with a bowl of burning incense in front of it. So we show the images of a male Ba and a female Ba a male spirit and a female spirit, the body of a bird, the head of the individual from whom that spirit belongs. 
So you have this little bird or this divine living energy that flies throughout your spirit body and circulates throughout your spirit body, which is animate within your spirit body like a bird flying throughout your spirit body and so forth. Our life force energy is expanded. The divine flame of the Ba, by it to stand through the breathing apparatus. So just like when you give oxygen to a flame and you fan the flames and the flames become bigger, within us, our life force energy, that burning fire within us, the divine flame of the Ba, the Ba'at, is fanned through the breathing apparatus. We increase our breath and fan our flames through ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, just like the prayer we read earlier. We take this into a ritual cadence. Those sound vibrations are not just something you read off of a page, but the sound vibrations themselves are energetic vibrations that are projected to provoke the energy of the Abosom or the Usamapo to elicit a response, an energetic response from them, and a conscious response as well. So we, fan, we increase our breath and fan our flames through ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, spirit possession, the ritual processes of Afurakani, Afurakani, the African ancestral religion. We thus magnify the requisite fire to destroy our enemies internally, spiritually, and externally. We generate that internal fire physically to burn up cancerous cells, impurities, bacteria that are negative and so forth. We generate the kind of fire motivation just like a martial artist to break blocks and everything else but to fight and have the motivation and the vitality to continue to fight our enemies until we kill our enemies. That's physically but also spiritually. This is the flame of Ra and Ra'et and the spell invocation of Serket who operates through the breathing apparatus, the thoracic cavity, working in concert to regulate the functioning of our pest so that the waste processing process proceeds without overreach. So in the text, when they talk about the flame of Ra in concert with the spell of Serket, and of course, a scorpion releases venom into the victim, and the victim, when it says, stand still, stand still, I pep retreat from Ra and so forth, and they retreat before the spell of Serket, when that scorpion sends venom into the body, what happens is it paralyzes the thoracic cavity the breathing apparatus, and the person can't breathe, and they begin to suffocate. They become still. They can't expand and contract. They, they stand still, stand still, and they begin to retreat. So that's the spell of Serket, releasing that venom into the enemy. But then you have the fire of Ra and Ra, burning up the enemy and so forth. But it's, the fire is uh, fanned through the, the breathing apparatus, through the, the functioning of Serket as well. So you have Ra and Ra and Serket working in concert with one another, to stop a pest from overstepping or overreaching with regard to its function in the body. That happens physically, but it also happens spiritually. The processing of waste can carry the potential of manifest disorder. However, the regulation of our pest maintains the proper processing of waste within our bodies, our spirits, our relationships, our afurakani, afurakani, omai, nation, upon asasi, afua, earth, and within the ancestral realm after transition. So our pep is a divinity. It's like every organ in your body is a shrine of a divinity. Every feature of the earth mother, the oceans, rivers, atmosphere, mountains, core, inner core, inner inner core, mantle, and so forth, these are different shrines for specific abosom deities to take up residence in and resonate through, and we can communicate with them through these shrines. Within our bodies, physically, the different organs and glands and so forth are shrines, centers of resonance for the divinities. They magnify the energy of the divinities and so forth. That includes the intestinal tract. And, of course, Apep dwells there and executes its function, just like your intestinal tract executes its function. But there's some backup or something takes place that's out of harmony with order, then your intestinal tract or the malfunctioning of that leads to disease, and it could lead to death. But if you're operating in harmony with order, that doesn't mean you remove your intestinal tract so that you can operate in harmony with order. You only operate in harmony with order when your intestinal tract is functioning properly in concert with the other organs and systems. 
it's important to understand that divine role of this divinity because some people will say that he's not a deity, he's actually the devil, he's a manifestation of his fet and so forth, and so we don't deal with our pep, and that's not accurate. That's like saying your immune system, because it carries waste and the waste is stinks and so forth, and of course you see in the text, it talks about the odor and so forth and how this, in the slaughtering chamber of Ra and so forth, that's talking about the odor within the intestinal tract and so forth, but also in the spirit realm. You wouldn't say that because your intestinal tract carries waste that uh, stinks and so forth and carries bacteria and things that are negative that you don't need an intestinal tract. You know what its function is, and it helps to move that waste out of you. The problem or the negativity is the waste that is developed in the uh, maleficent uh, bacteria, but, of course, that's forced out of the body anyway. So the beneficent bacteria and the tract itself the organal structure itself is necessary. So he operates on the spirit level and the physical level. We can easily see what has, takes place in the spirit, in the physical, on the physical level, but spiritually we're talking about those uh, bacterial, negative bacterial, maleficent bacterial individuals in our lives as well as those discarnate spirits who become maleficent as well, they need to be checked. Some need to be eradicated, disintegrated, so that we can continue to operate in harmony with order, keep this physical body and spirit body and communal body, um, physical and spiritual, intact and harmonious so we can execute our function in creation. We must also understand, just as a side note, we've talked about this, that some of the texts in ancient Kemetists especially in the late period when the Greeks and later Romans invade Kemet, then they start mixing up older um, expressions of cosmology and start adding attributes to certain deities and removing attributes from certain deities that are not in harmony with reality. So this is where you get this notion of Apep being the devil or Set being the devil or the, the embodiments of absolute evil and disorder and all of this other stuff. But in Earlier dynasties, of course, when we're publishing these texts and engaging in this ritual practice, we know exactly who these deities are, what their functions are, and so forth. So we must make a distinction between who's speaking. You don't just say, oh, this text from Kemet or this papyrus said this, so this must be it. What period does this, does this papyrus come from? What period does this text come from? Who was in charge at the particular time? What was the political situation at the particular time, was it an intermediate period where there was political instability? Then you see some of the works that manifest, manifest that political instability, or you see certain quote-unquote Semitic deities showing up, as we've talked about in our book, Koko Bo, during a period of instability where certain rulers came from the outside and invaded and took over a region of Kemet and so forth, foreigners, and they start uh, tampering with text and so forth and inserting foreign deities into the text, into the cosmologies and different things and also foreign ideas. And then when you see um, the papyri and the temple texts and everything else from periods of stability, you see those corruptions are not in those texts. So you need to understand where these texts are coming from, what time period, what was the political situation at the time and so forth. Now we're talking about this uh, intestinal tract, it has to do with consumption and our habits of consumption and how it affects our bodies. That's directly related to tonight being Egua Day or Marketplace Day. What are we consuming, whether it's not just physically in our bodies, but as a community? What are we taking in? What are we taking in to use to build ourselves, strengthen ourselves, edify ourselves, and expand our clans and expand our Omai, our Afurakani, Afurakani nation? And what are we taking in that's beneficial or not? So we're going to go to the next article that deals directly with this. We're going to place the link in the chat room. And it's on our WordPress site as well. And that particular article is called Okom, Overcoming the Paraplegic Nature of Awareness. And, of course, we mentioned earlier we published a document, Okom Economic Development Model. 
and you'll see on, in this article, you'll see the front page of that document, the Ocom Economic Development Model, but in this context, we're going to talk about Ocom and overcoming the paraplegic nature of awareness, and we'll show how it all links together. And we put awareness in quotes. This would not appear to be an issue amongst those who are considered, quote-unquote, culturally aware, however, for the most part it is. It is important to understand that awareness without action, movement, is meaningless. A paraplegic is aware. He or she can see and hear everything going on in the room. However, he or she cannot move, function, without depending upon someone else, even if that someone else in the room is an enemy. Many of our people are culturally paraplegic. We are culturally, quote unquote, aware of the devastating effects funding our enemies. And that has to do with consumption and digestion of what we're being given by our enemies and processing what could be nutrients and what could be waste from what we're receiving from our enemies. We're culturally, quote unquote, aware of the devastating effects of funding our enemies the whites and their offspring, yet we make weekly decisions to continue to fund them and thus consciously finance our own oppression. There are nearly 2 million black businesses in America. There are nearly 2 million unemployed black people in America. If each business hired one person, we solve the unemployment in our community literally overnight. This can easily be done when we starve the beast and feed the pride as we teach in our Ocom economic development model. In that economic development model, which is a model rooted in our ancestral religious values, we have this operation which deals with starving the beast and feeding the pride. That means we make a decision and an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we would have potentially wasted with the whites and the offspring, and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We reroute those funds away from the white businesses and direct them to the business organization or institution of the week. And we choose one business organization or institution per week. If you were going to spend $10 at Chipotle or Starbucks or, or Walmart or CVS for some product like a donut or Danish or coffee or something like that that you really don't need and you starve the beast and feed the pride, take that $10 away from the white business and direct it to the black business. Take $10 away you would have spent at Starbucks in the course of a week and direct it to a black-owned coffee shop in the course of a week. That's a transfer of $10 in capital. When 1,000 people engage that process and take $10,000, $10 each, and redirect that to the business of the week, then that means a black business receives $10,000 in capital and infusion. They can immediately hire black people to work full-time permanently in the business. They can expand their products and services to us so they can serve us at a greater capacity. So the things that we need that we're getting from white businesses we can get from this business all we have to do is take our money out of the white businesses and give it to the black business so they can provide the services and products that we need. So it's a win-win situation. If we do not starve the beast and feed the pride deliberately, then by default, we leave that $10,000 in the hands of our enemies. By default, we are financing our own oppression. That's why we must starve the beast and feed the pride. As a community, we spend about $20 billion per week. 95-plus percent of that is with white businesses, organizations, and institutions. That's $20 billion per week. At least 10% of that, at least $2 billion per week, could be spent on a weekly basis with black businesses, organizations, or institutions who provide the same or better products and services. Now, you may not have a black-owned car manufacturer, but when you're buying soap, when you're buying toilet paper, when you're buying um, laundry detergent, when you're buying food, when you're buying hair care products, when you're buying various things that you have to have on a regular basis, 
all of those products can be purchased directly from black-owned businesses. We can take at least 10% of the $20 billion we spend weekly, at least $2 billion, and reroute that, starve the beast and feed the pride and direct it specifically to black businesses, organizations, and institutions. Some of our people are sending children to private schools that are controlled by the whites and their offspring. They could redirect their children to a private black-owned school, African Center School, Afurakani, Afurakani School, or um, Home School Collective and so forth, and direct those funds directly to the black school. If you don't do that, you're simply financing those white individuals and those, their white children and their vacations and their schooling for their children and college funds for their children and so forth. We're going to support our absolute enemies or we're going to support ourselves. Starving the beast and feeding the pride means making that weekly assessment, as we said, consciously and deliberately redirecting those funds to the black business organization or institution of the week. We posted a uh, status on Facebook saying, reflection, have you supported a black business today? We should post that and think about that on a daily basis. Have you supported a black business today? most of our people would say no. If you ask the other question, have you supported a white business today, 100% of our people would say yes. So we're constantly supporting white Asians, white Europeans, white Americans, white Hindus, white Arabs, white Hispanics, white pseudo-Native Americans, and so forth. We're supporting our enemies, the whites and offspring, daily without question. But if you ask about have you supported a black business today, have you made a deliberate effort to do so, most days our people say no. And, of course, that can change instantaneously and must change. We spend billions of dollars on products and services that we do not need, some even deadly alcohol, cigarettes, junk food, white movies, white entertainment, $2 billion per week being rerouted to 2 million black businesses, which there are about 2 million black businesses in the country, $2 billion per week being rerouted to 2 million black businesses per week equals $1,000 per week in additional revenue for each black business. Imagine if you are an entrepreneur and all of a sudden, every week you receive an additional $1,000 because black people decided to start patronizing your business instead of patronizing white people for the same product. 1000 per week in additional revenue for every black business in America. That's $52,000 per year. That is a salary for one person per business. That is the unemployment problem solved overnight. Simply making the decision to shift 10% of the money we spend on a weekly basis away from white businesses to black businesses $1,000 per week for every one of the 2 million black businesses in the country. That's $52,000 a year. That is a, a better salary for one employed individual. They could hire a person and say, we're going to pay you $52,000 a year. It could even be at a, a black-owned gas station, a cashier, a black-owned coffee shop. They can bring in someone, or including yourself, and say, we have a position open now because black people have been supporting our coffee shop. We have a position open. You can start today. You can be um, working the front, making coffee for people. We're going to pay you $52,000 a year to serve coffee, coffee to black people in the black community, simply because we made the decision. When we don't make that decision, that $52,000 a year per 2 million businesses is going to a white business, and you've decided by default, let me give the $1,000 I'm not going to give it to a black person. I'm going to give it to my enemy. So a white person can have a $52,000 a year job and 2 million white people. We're, we can employ 2 million white people at 52000 a year instead of employing 2 million black people at 52000 a year. What are we going to do? Are we going to make the decision to employ our enemies with our money at 52000 a year or employ our own people at 52000 a year? Imagine somebody who doesn't have a college degree, but they have a job, 52000 a year, and they can begin to 
They can purchase a house, a condo. They can put their children in an African-centered, Apurakani, Apurakani school. They can support black businesses and so forth, and on and on. Now, every time you spend a dollar, you are either employing your enemy or employing your family. That's the bottom line. Every dollar that you spend, every time you hit enter after making an online purchase, you are either employing your enemy or employing your family. The ka, the kayat, the soul, the okra, okra, the ori inu, the selido is our divine consciousness, the deity in our head region. It is nabosom and orisha vodu, ntoro, ntoro, deity dwelling in our head region. It's Apurakani, Apurakani people. It is the spirit's brain. This Abosom, this divinity, divine consciousness dwelling in our head region does not direct us to finance our own oppression. Never has and never will. We talked about the Ba and Ba, the divine living energy within us, the spirit, called Obra and Obra and Akan. It is our divine living energy. It is the child of Ra and Ra'et, Nyonkompon and Nyonkompon, the creator and creatress, which gives us the power to execute what is written in the Ka, Kayat, the soul. It is the life force energy animating us as Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people. It empowers us to execute our divine function, Nkra, Nkrabia, in creation. So just like you have a brain that has the entire blueprint of what should take place in the body, but then you have vital energy carried in the bloodstream and so forth that gives you the animate power, the vital power to execute that function. So you're not just aware having a brain. You're not just paraplegic, aware but paralyzed. You're aware you have consciousness and knowledge of what should happen, and you have the vital power to make it happen, to bring it into being. You have a ka, a kaya, a soul, a divine consciousness dwelling in the head region, but you also have a ba or a bayat divine living energy so that you have the power to execute those plans that are within the consciousness. It empowers us to execute our divine function and creation. This includes who we interface with and individuals with whom we engage in exchange, including economics. This abosom, this divinity, the ba, the ba'et, does not empower us and energize us to finance our own oppression. The ka, kayat, the soul, the ba, bayat, the spirit, the consciousness and power, awareness and action must be integrated. We see the results of their disintegration. Cultural paraplegics, aware of our enemies while perpetually depending upon financing our open enemies. Cultural paraplegia. This while 2 million black people remain unemployed and black businesses, organizations, and institutions cut back on product lines, services, and some go out of business. Simultaneously, memes like on Facebook and Instagram and so forth stating, quote unquote, buy black, are liked and shared by hundreds of thousands on social media. Liking and sharing is quote-unquote awareness. Going to the website or business and making a purchase or contribution is action, movement. We make a conscious decision to starve the beast and feed the pride every week. We consciously and deliberately patronize some black business organization or institution in person and online on a weekly basis. This is an ancestral mandate, and this is what we follow those who are consciously and understanding they are part of Ojira Mind, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. This is an ancestral mandate. We make that decision consciously and deliberately and continuously on a weekly basis. We patronize black business organizations, institutions, in person and online on a weekly basis consistently. It is part of our Afurakani, Afurakani ancestral religious practice. It is not an idea. It's not a meme. It's not a slogan. We're not part of this sloganeering culture or subculture where you're just posting memes and slogans that sound good but 
while you're actually on the phone posting memes, you're standing in a white business about to patronize them, but you never go to the black business website and actually contribute. You just post a meme or like or share something saying support black business. For us, this is not a meme or a slogan. It's part of our ancestral religious practice to support black business. It is a religious conviction. This is part of our religion. Are you honestly integrating your ka, kaet, your soul, and your ba, baet, the divine living energy, to empower your soul to do the same? The answer to that question is a determinant of the condition millions of our people continue to exist in. If you say no, you're not honestly engaged in supporting your awareness through action, then that determines the condition of millions of our people. At least 2 million black people are unemployed because we are not making the decisions collectively to actually support black businesses. We're just sloganeering. In Afurakani, Afurakani, the ancestral religion, inclusive of our expressions in North America, Kudu, which is the Akan tradition in North America, Voodoo, which is the Ebe and Bone tradition in North America, Juju, which is the Yoruba tradition in North America, Wanga, which is the Obambo tradition in North America, and Gangan, which is the Fang tradition in North America, Grigri, which is the Bambara tradition in North America, Gala and Gichi, which is the Gola and Kisi tradition in North America, and so forth. In these ancestral religious practices, economic development is part of our religious cosmology. It's not just a belief or a political act. It's religious. It has to be for the Ka, the Kayat, the soul, and the Ba, by the spirit requires it. Creation is an economy. And we must participate in that economy in harmony with the divine laws that undergird it, animated by Ma'a and Ma'at, the male and female, are both some of divine law and balance. When economic development is recognized rightly by Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people as religious conviction, change manifests overnight and perpetually. Okom, which is the name of our economic development model, is an Akan term meaning possession. When we talk about akom, the akom, ritual service, that means someone has been possessed by a deity or an ancestral spirit. The spirit has entered into the body and operating through the individual. Akom means possession. This means possession of material goods as well as spirit possession. Material goods empower us to survive. Spiritual, quote, unquote, goods empower us to thrive and overcome obstacles in harmony with divine order spirit possession, and material possession, Okom is the foundation of balanced and integrated economic development, guided and animated by our Ka, Ka'et, the soul, the divine consciousness, and the Ba, the Ba'et, the divine living energy that animates us. So this is the foundation of, of an economic development model, Okom, rooted in our ancestral religious values. For us, just like you engage in ritual practice to heal disease, to empower our people, to build with regard to nation building and restoration and so forth, creation in and of itself is an economy in the way we interface with one another as created entities in creation, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and Afurakani, Afurakani, human life only. We're part of the economy of the great divine body of the supreme being. And we operate interdependently upon one another. And that economy is undergirded by the laws expressed through Ma'a and Ma'at, the male and female divinities of divine law and balance. That's part of our religious practice to realign ourselves, our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. That includes the expression of order, which is Ma'a and Ma'at, the laws that govern all of creation. If you're attuning to your kind, kind, your soul, divine consciousness, and you're invoking your ba, your ba is your divine living energy that empowers you engaged in behavior to execute what's in your ka, your ka is your consciousness, then it's a religious conviction when you evoke or invoke your ka and ka of your ba and ba, it's a religious conviction to engage in economic decisions that support the all mind, the nation. Again, an Oman, talking about the Afurakani, Afurakani, Oman, or nation, is a living, breathing entity. Just like your organ is an entity. It has its own function. It serves the greater divine body, but the organ has children. 
which are the cells. We are the cells, it's plant life, animal life, mineral life, and afurakani, afurakani, human life of the body, but of specific organs. As collectives within certain organs and glands, we serve the functions of our parent organs and glands. The parent organ or gland is a shrine for a major divinity. That parent organ or gland is a nation, and the cells are a collective of individuals functioning together to support that quote-unquote nation. But when supporting that quote-unquote nation also supports the deity that animates that organ or gland or shrine of that nation. So nation building or nationism, the purification of nationalism, is rooted in our proper understanding spiritually, culturally, cosmologically, of the nation itself being a living and breathing entity that was fashioned by the supreme being and rich cells that take up residence in that entity. And we operate in harmony with one another only when we're invoking the deity that governs the nation, the organ, the gland. You can't operate in harmony with one another without invoking the divinities of divine law and balance. That includes supporting one another, being interdependent upon one another, exchanging nutrients and so forth, just like cells exchange nutrients, we exchange energy, we exchange nutrients, we exchange between one another. That's an economy. That's part of our religion. If you do not support black businesses, you're not supporting the cells that are part of your organal structure. You're not supporting the deity that governs you as an mine, as a nation. When we understand the nation as a living, breathing entity governed by our Bosom, Mauritius, Vodou, and so forth, and we invoke that divinity, will be directed to support the cells within that nation that includes its economy, that includes Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, which are simply expressions of functions within the divine organ. That's all that businesses are. And when the divine organ is governed by Abosom and we adhere to the uh, dictates of that Abosom, then we have to support the businesses or the expressions of the support of that organ within the organal structure. So this is what we talk about with regard to Okon, economic development. When you download that article, you'll see we go through the seven principal values of nation building, which includes, um, of course, establishing, establishing sound systems of um, agriculture and so forth, so we're uh, methods of food production and preservation. So, of course, you can feed yourself if you are you're independent. If you can't feed yourself and you're dependent on your enemy to feed yourself, you're not independent. So establishing sound systems of um, food production and preservation, establishing systems of curing disease, establishing a military structure to defend the Oman, the nation, institutionalizing your values by establishing institutions of education, training, institutions, educational institutions, military institutions, governmental institutions, and so forth, because you institutionalize your values and you train so you can develop people within the nation to sustain the nation and so forth, establishing sound systems of governance and jurisprudence so that disputes can be mitigated in a harmonious fashion so the nation does not fracture and fall apart through infighting and war and so forth, building, constructing homes on acquired land, and then the seventh principle, of course, is manufacturing of clothing, dealing with textiles, and so forth. So these seven principal values of nation building, they're governed by the Yabosom, the deities that govern the seven days of the week and the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven days of the week and also govern our natural cycles. So we have an economic development model which is rooted in the forces in creation that animate all natural cycles. It's a holistic approach to economic development that is Okom, spirit possession and material possession spiritual possessions and material possessions in balance. Spiritual possession empowers us to overcome specific obstacles. Material possessions empower us to su survive. Spiritual good empower us to thrive and overcome obstacles in harmony with divine order. So this is what we're dealing with with regard to Okong, and that's connected to consumption and everything else. So we're going to take a couple of calls um, on the phone line. If you have any questions or comments in the chat room, you can post those as well. Uh, before we get into that, um, one of the things with regard to economic development, we have two things taking place. We have in February, the weekend of the 16th to the 19th, 
We have our retreat, the Happy Medi Hybrid Nation Training, Cultural, and Ritual Retreat. It's going to be on Edisto Island, South Carolina, one of the Gullah Islands, one of those ancestral sanctuaries. We're having the retreat. We're going to have the workshops on Obedima Afurakani Manhood. I'll be conducting that workshop for the brothers. Obatai Afurakani Womanhood, based on the book. Obatai Afurakani Womanhood, Dr. Ia Adwa. She will be conducting that session. I will also be conducting the Patasa Satem educational curriculum section, session and so forth. So we'll have individual sessions, but also joint sessions on Saturday and Sunday um, in, in the morning and early afternoon, in the late afternoons. Once the sessions are over, people will be able to go out and vacation on the Gullah Islands and so forth and explore and do whatever you would like to do. So on one hand, it's a vacation. On, on the other hand, it's training for Obatai and Obedima Afrakani Kaitni womanhood, Afrakani manhood. So when we leave the session, leave the retreat, we go out into our communities and impact Afrakani men and Afrakani women in a positive capacity. Of course, we will also have vegan food available and so forth throughout the weekend. So when you go to the site, we closed registration a couple of weeks ago. However, a couple of cancellations opened up a few spaces. At first, there were four spaces opened up. Two of those spaces were taken. We have two spaces open, still left open. Um, they're first come, first serve. If you would like to attend the retreat, you can go on our website now, g.fo.com slash hapi dash html You can reserve your space. There are a couple of spaces left. You'll see there's a payment plan there as well. It's a $200 fee, registration fee, but there's a payment plan where you can break that up. You'll see that on the site. They are first come, first serve. We can't hold spaces for people. Whoever comes up first can take those last two spaces, and then registration will be closed. We also talked about and began a few weeks ago our Black Swan Life Movement, our first T-shirts, Black Swan Life. You see the image of Ames Nefertari, the Sankofa symbol, the black swan, the primordial waters, and the medusu on the T-shirt, and the quote on the back talking about the elegance of the black swan representing the Afraikadi woman. Of course, you would not tell a swan that they need to have neck implants in order to be beautiful. That slender form that they manifest is a sacred form. The same is true for the form of our Afuraikadi woman. We do not adhere to standards of quote-unquote beauty set forward by our enemies who cannot possibly manifest beauty on any level. The whites and their offspring, our people are spending money getting injections and, and using all kinds of substances to disfigure their bodies, bleach their skin, straighten out their hair, do all kinds of negative things to their bodies and so forth. We have this movement moving forth, which is rooted in our ancestral religious values, this black swan-like movement, and the first T-shirts are part of the launch of that movement, and you see the hashtag, hashtag black swan life. We're promoting that. You can purchase your shirts from the website. We would like, of course, in the tradition of supporting black business to support a black business in order to be able to print through the black printer. We have to have a certain number of shirts for a bulk order so we can utilize that printer because of the expense. He doesn't just do one T-shirt at a time and so forth. We do not want to use the white printers that are less expensive who do uh, print one T-shirt at a time at a lower cost. So we're trying to get to that point where we can get 50 shirts. We have a few people who have ordered, about six or seven people have ordered. We can get about 25 people to order two shirts. We have 50 right there, and we can go to the black printer and have it all done in that fashion. So if you appreciate the work we're doing and want to support what we're doing, you can get that Black, Life, Black Swan Life shirt for yourself, sisters, wives, daughters, nieces, aunts, grandmothers, any female in your life when they see the cosmology manifest in the symbols on the shirt as well as the web page which goes into detail about that. And then, of course, we have our books and so forth that go into detail about this cosmology. This is part of a movement to reawaken, realign ourselves, not only our sisters, but the brothers as well. The sisters wouldn't be engaged in these self-destructive body disfiguring practices if brainwashed Negroes weren't desiring black women to look like the whites in their offspring. 
So we need to purify the minds of the Afurakani men as well as the Afurakani women. So this movement is part of that process, an educational movement. And we want eventually millions of our sisters to take on that moniker, that black swan life. So you can see that on the website as well. Take, make that deliberate action, as we said earlier, to support a black business, not just liking and sharing, but actually moving forward. We want to go beyond the culturally paraplegic idea and function where we're very aware and knowledgeable, but at the end of the day, the White Snarl Spring laughs at Negroes online who are, have their traditional names and posting by black and everything else. But at the end of the day and the end of the week, that same $20 billion is going right into their coffers. So it's a joke to them when they see us posting memes all over Facebook. That means nothing because they know we're giving the money right to them, and they're watching our black businesses go out of business. All the while, people are posting black fists and red, black, and green flags and talking about buying black. So we need to actually move beyond that cultural paraplegic mindset. So we're going to go to the phone line. I'm um, Tio on the phone line, number 1295. You had a question or a comment? Michio, well, yeah. Um I'm, I'm trying to make sure I understand what uh, OPEP in this capacity. So we're talking about the transition from l the, the living realm to the ancestral realm and all of the things in between, basically, whether they be things that help guide us or things that get in our way. So you, so, and, and the mirror, of course, is the physical body. So the um, physically, the intestinal tract, you have the large intestine, you know, um, as well as the small intestinal tract and so forth, and the capillaries within that, that's the physical mm -hmm. shrine for that spiritual force of our pet. And, okay. of course, it has a peristaltic function, and it's moving the food and so forth and everything, but it has a, a function in your body that's supportive of everything that's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. Some of the bacteria oh. that manifest within there can be beneficial. Some of the bacteria that manifest can be maleficent. So we have to right. make sure we keep the maleficent bacteria, we get, get rid of that. Spiritually, when we transition and leave our physical bodies and go to the underworld or the spirit realm, there are certain homeless type spirits who will pull on us and try to provoke us just like they did when they were alive. And try, you're walking home, walking past a homeless person, and they jump out and try to grab you and pull you in an alley. If you don't fight them off, then you can out it. So the same thing happens there. We're trying to make our transition to live amongst the ancestresses and ancestors in harmony so we can continue our development. Some negative entities will try to pull us in different directions. So when we function harmoniously, engage our ancestral culture, we can repel them. The same is true physically. If you have different substances or bacteria that's trying to pull you in different directions, when you engage in harmonious dietary practices and ritual practices, you can repel that negativity as well. Okay, so on the, on the, while we're on that path, so our families and also us as um, spirits in transition, we can invoke circuits to help us in that in that transition. Absolutely, she's one okay. of those major divinities. She's sitting right. You know, the shrine of her is a thoracic, you know, structure within your body. Yes, yeah, she's a major divinity, and that's, that's part of that process. Okay. Now, um, I always figured that when it came down to the, um, the, the stomach and, and um, the intestine and taking food and making it either nutrients or waste, does that have anything to do with, with Kepra at all? Now, in, in what context do you mean? Well, I mean, because Kepra, he's, I kind of see him as like a divinity of um, transformation, I suppose, and, and taking one substance and making a different substance kind of a thing and kind of in the same capacity of taking food and taking it from, you know, one substance and then turning it into something that can be nutritious and then also waste kind of, kind of a thing. Okay, so you, you're talking about... In in the context of that functioning, is it connected to? Yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the in the in the in the in the physical in the, in the physical body, not 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 in the, not in the um, in the transition, but in the physical body, does Kepra have anything to do with that region? Is there is there any shrine for Kepra in that 
in that area. Okay. So now, on one hand, since Kepra, and, and he does actually physically as well as spiritually, that transitional piece, he's there as well. So you'll see him in the boat next. To, you'll see Atem and Kepra in the boat with Ra on both sides of the cross. So sometimes they'll read the text and they talk about I'm, Ra says I'm Kepra in the morning and Ra at noon and, and Atem in the evening. And some people say it's the same deity with different forms, but actually they're three different deities. And Kepra does participate in the transitional phase as well, in the spirit realm, as well as physically. As far as the functioning, the overall functioning, he is a major divinity. Kepri is a female divinity. Beto, she's also a major divinity. So as far as that functioning and transformation, yes, he's right in that process. Now, his major shrine in the body, you'll, you'll see when you look at the beetle, um, if you look at the, the brain and the cranium, if you look at the hard, you know, uh, shell of the beetle oh, okay. from the top yeah. down, and you look at the cranium from the top down, yeah. you'll see, you know, Kepra sitting right there. Okay. With that, that's in the upper region. That's in the quote-unquote heavenly region, which is the head. And then the that's earthly perfect. region, which is the physical body, yet you'll find him functioning in that that transitional part. So when you have the food and, you know, the nutrients are being extracted, now the waste product is the thing that wants to be, but then, of course, we want to eliminate. But the transformation part or the, quote, unquote, evolution part or the Kepra part, the transformation from food stuff to energy that's used for our vitality, Kepra is participating in that process. So he, you can find him in the intestines and find him in different organs as well because he's, he's making that transition from food to that extraction to energy. So he's there. Okay. But it's, it's making okay, him now, in the head region. In the head region. Okay. All right. Now, um, in the Cuckoo Two Tomb, you go into um, talking about Wati and the um, Tai Chi and how Wati are the servants of Apep and how the the, uh, the Kaitiwu, they are the um, the ones who defend Ra against his enemies, who would be Wati and Apep. Now, I'm trying to understand if there's any connection in what we're talking about now, where, like, the Kaitiwu be the, the beneficial bacteria, in, in in a sense, or is that something totally different? I, I mean, what what's the, what's the relation to Apep in the Achiwade flow? Right. So you have... This is the relationship. So you have a the intestinal tract, which is an say you, before you have any food in the an, intestinal tract, before anything comes through, it's an organ. It's a divine organ. There's nothing wrong with that. Then some food comes in, and that's that's no problem either because the food has nutrients and everything else, and you can extract nutrients when it's going through the small intestine and into the large and so forth. There's no problem then. But then, once the nutrients are extracted, then you have waste. Now, that's the part that you want to force out, but it's actually in the sanctuary of the deity of Apep. But then that mm-hmm. waste attracts parasitic entity. And the mm-hmm. watch you, like you were talking about, which means, you know, those are rebelling against order, that wah-wah meaning to rebel, Yes, those are the parasitic entities, the cancerous entities. That's just a title for it. disordered entities, rebellious entities. And the kaiju, and you see them in the Medusku show holding a knife, and they're cutting and slashing and so forth. They're cutting off, you know, this, uh, disordered entities, just like cancerous tumors being cut off, or, or you have uh, um, immune system cells going and attacking and chopping and cutting into cancer cells and so forth. So, yes, the kaiju down there in the intestinal tract, but also in different parts of the body because, you know, sometimes cancer cells manifest in different organs and so forth, and the immune system cells go to those organs and lymphatic cells, and they go and wage war against those cancer cells. So, yes, you'll find those down there in where, you know, in the intestinal tract, but you find them in other areas as well. Okay. Excellent. Matt, I say, I actually, I have one more question real quick. Um, I was trying to figure okay. out, um, I was trying to figure out which of also um, take up residence in the, um, um, in the skeletal structure 
Like, is there a major bolt stone that takes that takes possession of that entire structure, or is it broken up? And also the um, the muscular structure. Are there specific bolt that take up residence or have shrines in in these structures? Yes. Yeah, so you'll find that um, Sekher, the divinity Sekher, which is you know they'll talk about him being the uh, deity of the underworld and death and Sakra and the, the region of Sakra and ancient Kemet, where the Step Pyramid is and so forth. Um, and we did a broadcast on him in his in his role as a divinity in the underworld, dealing with gold and so forth. But um, Sak, Sakra, one of the meanings of that, Sak has to do with bones. So that's that underworld, quote unquote, structure, the bony structure. You have, and sometimes what you'll see is a union of Pata and Seker. Pata, Seker, sometimes Pata, Seker, and Asar. But um, we have Pata and Seker. The, the reason why there's a Pata and Seker like that is because Seker is dealing with that bony structure. Pata is the fire at the center or the core of earth, which is the, actually the inner core. So when you oh, have, okay. and you also have Sekmet, who's also the female in the inner core, that inner fire. So you have Pata and Sekmet We're tra- operating talking about the marrow, marrow and stuff like that. Yeah. Right, the fire in the bones, the marrow in the bones. So you have Pata and Sekmet, you know, deep within the marrow. But that bony structure, which is an underworld structure, is governed by Sekhar. And, of course, the muscular structure comes into that. So you also have um, deities like Heru Bedeti um, governing that muscular structure, as well as uh, Main Tu. So you look hmm. at the war divinity, Main Tu. Uh, mm-hmm. He's connected to the adrenal glands, but also that muscular explosive power. And the same thing with um, Heru Bedeti. He governs the immune system, but he's connected to that muscular, externally, that muscular power as well. All right. All right. Thank you very much. May I say, heads up. You have a good night. Okay, you too. Any other Appreciate the call. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to another call on the phone line. Michiobo on the phone line number 0217. You got a question or a comment? Uh, number zero two one seven. Question or comment on the phone line? Okay, we're gonna move on to eight one six two on the phone line. You had a question or a comment? Mitchell well. Mitchell, what's up? I had a question about um, a phrase in a text that I kept seeing. Um, a reference to um, someone being stung by a scorpion. I didn't quite understand what the scorpion sting um, means. What? Yeah, I don't. I don't quite understand what the sto- scorpion sting is. Okay. Now, what? So, which you know, which text? I mean, what was the context in the text? What were they? What was the context talking about? I was reading some different chapters in Legends of the Gods. Okay. And I believe it might it, Oh, you? It's, it is, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just wondering if you were talking about the, talking about Ron on set, that particular one, or were you talking about, um, for example, a text talking about how to overcome or heal the um, sting from a scorpion? There's a, there's a text talking about that as well as far as healing. That's one, and then I saw, I think it might have been Bass Fett that was stung by a scorpion, too. But I, I didn't understand what they mean by being stung by a scorpion, what that symbolizes. Okay. So it's a, a couple of things, just on the physical level. So when they're on the mundane level, talking about ancient Kemet. So some of the symbolism, some things we, we're not, we wouldn't, readily recognized because that's not part of our environment. Over there, because there's, you know, lush land along the river, but then right outside of that land is desert. There are scorpions over there. That was a regular occurrence. So, for example, well, a friend of mine told me one time when she got um, stung by a scorpion going into the Grand Canyon and stepped, stepped on the scorpion, got stung, and everything that happened and, you know, what you need to do to heal it, but it was very painful and everything else. So 
some of the symbolism was talking about what was happening in their environment, and then it's related to certain things that happen to us spiritually as well. So people would get stung by scorpions on a regular basis. They suffer if you don't hurry up and, you know, take care of it in the proper way, then you can die from it. And the specific, you know, uh, symptoms are different than, you know, say a bee sting or something like else like that. The venom from a scorpion, you know, affects the thoracic functioning, and then your breathing becomes paralyzed and you begin to suffocate. That's the effect that it has. In the same fashion, if somebody is engaged in disordered activity, and they come across people or individuals or even this kind of spirits and relatives or non-relatives and so forth, whether they're here in the physical world making a transition and they get involved or interface with certain people and they get off track, they can have an experience where certain people, just like certain people would try to attack somebody, beat them up and steal something from them. And, you know, you fight them back or whatever. Some people try to steal something from you. Some people try to bludgeon you and fight you and beat you down, take something from you. Then you have other people who want to go beyond that. They want to control you, so they, you know, attack or something, capture you and tie you up and, you know, put uh, bonds around your hands, feet, and, and mouth and so forth and try to, you know, basically paralyze you. Different criminals have different methods, and it's the same thing spiritually. Some spirits attack or try to influence you in a negative fashion, you feel a pain in your side or a pain in your head or a pain in, you know, somewhere else, some spirits try to attack and you start feeling dizzy, they're trying to influence you in that fashion, some spirits, you know, come and basically, quote, unquote, sit on your chest, and like the hoodoo tradition, they'll say a, a witch is riding you and so forth, try to sit on your chest and you can hardly breathe. You're waking up. You can't move. You can't move your arm. can't move your legs. You can't even scream out that, that you know, sleep paralysis, as they call it sometimes. It's a discarnate spirit trying to pressure you and, you know, control you, and you can't expand and contract properly. It's like a scorpion sting in that sense in, the, in a negative context. They're trying to control your expansion and contraction so you can't have access to that vital power that will repel them. But, of course, the invocation of whether it's Serket or Ra and Rayat, which leads to a connection to Serket to repel entities like that, as well as in the physical world, drawing on your life force energy, your by and by, to burn them up, to repel them, whether you burn them up spiritually and project that kind of fiery energy or you generate that kind of fiery energy within you physically so you can go and beat somebody down and body slam them and have the vitality to continue to beat them down until you kill them or neutralize them, or whatever the case may be, that's an invocation of Ra, Riot, and Serket. So that's, that's what's taking place in the text. There are different um, expressions of how people attack physically or spiritually, as well as the mundane, you know, um, notion of an actual scorpion stinging somebody and they begin to have uh, difficulty breathing and the suffering that, you know, extends from that. Okay, another phrase I kept seeing that I didn't quite understand what it symbolized was um, under the knife. It would refer to, um, Bast was another one, another divinity that they talked about being under the knife, and it was um, another one that it just kept saying over and over, this um, divinity that's under the knife. And I didn't quite understand what they meant by under the knife if the under the knife was the attack or the under the knife was protection. Right. So it, it, it depends on the context. It will be one of those two. Um, because you'll see like the brother I called and he talked about the kaiku and the term kayat and ket is the ordinary term hate. But when you look at the medusa and you'll see the actual determinative, it's a male or a female and they're actually holding a, a knife and they're using it in a way to protect, defend, and stab and attack. When you look at talking about our pep, they often talk about we're putting our knives in our pep and we're going to stick the knives, and they show knife, a bunch of knives in our pep's body, attacking him and so forth, trying to stop him from overreaching, his, overstepping his, his functioning and so forth. So, yeah, sometimes it has to do with attack. Um, 
you know, attacking the enemy. Sometimes it has to do with defense. Um, sometimes it's protecting your own physical body. That includes, you know, if you're ill and you take some kind of uh, anti-inflammatory or some purgative or something like that, you're attacking or stabbing away at these cancer cells or tumors or cysts or whatever it is. So that's healing, protecting yourself, but also actually attacking an enemy, an incoming enemy. So it can be, depending on the context, that's what they're talking about. We appreciate the call. Yeni, I'll say that. And then you also also have a, uh, for example, in the text that we read, it, it talks about, if you scroll up, just to put another point on that, when we read the section, uh, it's talking about get back our pep, enemy of rod and all of that. Um, and it says your head will be cut off. Of course, they're talking about knives, and the slaughter of you will be carried out. You will not lift up your face, for his or Ra's flame is in your spirit. Um, the odor which is in his chamber of slaughter is in your members, and your form will be overthrown by the slaughtering knife of the great God. They're talking about the great God. In this particular context, they're talking about Ra. And, of course, Ra is the goddess in this context when they're talking about the knife of Ra in this context, they're talking about, and, and, and they also say the flame of Ra, they're talking about those sunlight, those sun beams, that fiery energy that can pierce and destroy and cut. And it's not just symbolic. Of course, if you look at a, a laser, people have laser surgery for their eyes and so forth. That's just a concentration of solar energy in reality, and that laser beam being used to cut away, you know, that which has become uh, degenerated. So that life force energy, the beams, the fire from Ra, cutting through and penetrating like a knife to destroy and kill cancer cells and entities and so forth. And of course, the sunlight can, you know, people can die from overexposure of sunlight as well, developing skin cancers and things like that. So that's, those are some of those knives, those daggers, those Spears being shot out through the sun and other stars by Ra and Ra. Okay, on the phone line zero zero two one seven. You had a question or a comment? Uh, yes. Good night, uh, brother, uh, brother Quasi. Um, my question was, um, how accurate? Or um, the ancestral DNA test, do you feel? Is it um, an accurate reflection of spiritually um, who you are, or what is your feeling on it? Um, well, it can be, and it depends on what's going on. So, for example, what they typically what they have, they have three major tests. They have the mitochondrial DNA test, which you know receives that from your mother. So okay. your mother, and then her mother, and her mother, and her mother, and her mother in one line going straight back. And then okay. the Y chromosomal DNA test that shows, you know, DNA received from your father and his father and his father and his father and his father going in a straight line all the way back. Of course, the females can't get that. They would have to, you know, have their brother get tested because the female doesn't have a Y chromosome and so forth. So they would have to get a you know, um, a brother or a male relative in the line to find out, you know, to get that Y chromosome test and so forth. Then they have the mixture test where they deal with percentages. They're dealing with that nuclear DNA and, and percentages of what well, percentage of your know, DNA is, you know, they'll say 85% West Afrikani, Afrikani, or, you know, 10% right. of that. So, but the thing is, it's, it can it can give you a, a piece of your information depending on what's taking place. So, for example, um, say your mother and then her mother and her mother and her mother and, and her mother going back to your great 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 grandmother. Maybe your great 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 grandmother was Akan, and she was brought into North America, and she had a daughter, and she passed that Akan DNA on, and you know, and so forth, coming all the way down to you. Mm -hmm. And if you were one of her ancestresses who lived on the continent as an icon person, 
Okay. And then, you know, the descendants were sent to America and generation after generation they were sent here. And then you, one of your great, 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 great granddaughters, which is your mother, she grew up, became a woman, got married, and then she drew the Akan ancestress back into the world, which was you and you were born and grew up and so forth. When you did your DNA test, it would go back all the way to that great, great grandmother who was Akan, and it would be 100% true because physiologically it's her and you know, spiritually, if you have returned. Now, if your great, 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 great grandmother was Akan, but she married an Igbo man uh, on a plantation because they were forced into different marriages and so forth, and you were the ancestress of the Igbo man, you were one of his great grandmothers, but he married an Akan woman, and okay. when they had a child, the child came from her side, so the child was an Akan ancestress who came through, and that child grew up, and she married somebody, and that child grew up and brought another Akan ancestress through, and that child grew up, married somebody, and brought another Akan ancestress through, but then you, that child would be your mother. She grew up, married somebody, and she, it was time for her to bring one of her ancestresses or ancestors through and she drew you into the womb, you are a descendant, not of her great-great-great-great-grandmother, but her grandmother's husband, who was Igbo. You're an Igbo ancestor, mm-hmm. but you were drawn through that line and you came through. Your mitochondrial DNA would say you're Akan, but you're actually an Igbo ancestress who came from the Akan great-great-grandmother's husband's side. And that mm-hmm. would not pick that up. But if you had somebody tested from the great-grandmother's husband's side who's still alive, it would pick that up. You would just have to know who to ask to get a test. And if you, if you didn't know they were Igbo, you were like, hey, my great-great-great-grandmother married this man named Enzi, you know, um, which is a version of an Igbo name. I want to test the uh, descendants of Enzi and see what's up. And then you'll find out, oh, he was Igbo. Oh, and he had a great grandmother who was, you know, an Igbo, who was a great woman, and so forth. And that turns out to be you. So you would have to know who's who. It's the same thing on the father's side. It's a direct line on the Y chromosomal test. If you came incarnated through that direct line, it would be 100 percent accurate. If you incarnated through the direct line and he married somebody else, then the test would not pick that up. So that's that's the difference. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, thanks. Oh, my other question was, um, I read some of your work on the, um, the uh, gosh, how do I say, um, uh, Genevois, the, um, the totems that are important to some, some of the clans. Um, is that another right. way you could tell? Okay, because like, um, like the ravens. The black uh, raven. Is that another way that you could tell, like, what clan are you from? That type of thing. Yes, that's one of the most direct ways because the different different groups on the continent, and and of course, as we moved here in North America, um, we maintained that. And then, of course, some of the animal totems would shift slightly. So, if there was a crocodile animal totem in Ghana, like Bosom uh, Afram and Bosom Pra which is a patch clan divinity and the sacred animal totem, the Achinibwa is a crocodile. You get here in North America, they will send an alligator because there's not crocodiles in, you know, in Virginia or Florida and so forth. They will send an alligator, same thing, or they'll have the black crow as well as the raven. They're in the same family and energy complex, so if they want to communicate with their descendants, they will send a crow if, if they were living in a region where there were no ravens. So, but yes, different groups whether they're Yoruba, Akan, Ebe, Fon, they have their relationships with their ancestors and ancestors. They forge a specific relationship with their clan, and their people send animal totems that are, are the totems of their clan. So when they want to communicate with you and identify who you are, they will send those animal totems to confirm them. So that's one of the most direct ways to find out. So then how are you supposed to know other than... 
well, directly, like, what is the message other than, well, this is, like, in general, like, a warning when they appear? Like, if you're seeing, like, okay, that, that particular raven, like, appearing, you know, before something happens, how are you supposed to decipher, like, what right. is it that... So, no, the, the work that allows you to pinpoint and have direct, clear communication, which becomes more and more consistent is establishing a relationship, an ongoing relationship with your Nananoman, Samanfo, your Egungun, your ancestors and ancestors of your blood circle who are spiritually cultivated. So we establish an Nkomre, an ancestral shrine, and begin to go. That's, that's the primary institution of learning within ancestral religion is that ancestral shrine. We don't just, we don't just set up an ancestral shrine and pour libation and give an offering and then that's it. We, that's like, that's like um, making an announcement to tell all your family members to come to your house. Once they come over, you give them some water, and then you get in the car and drive away. The reason why you give the water and give the food to draw your ancestors and ancestors there, that's the introduction. Then you sit down, and then you learn. You ask questions. You ask about different things that are happening. You share experience, and learn directly from them. So people, whether they're sitting down for 10 minutes or an hour or two hours at the shrine, depending on what's going on, on a consistent basis, some people are going on a daily basis, some people are going on every other day. It just depends on the pact that you make with your insamanfo. The length of time that you spend with them depends on your relationship with them, and you'll be drawn to stay or leave, depending on that relationship. But developing a consistent communication, the receptivity becomes more sharp, the communications become more vivid, whether it's clairvoyant or clairaudient or through your dreams or through, you know, things that are happening throughout the course of the day. They begin to communicate on a more consistent, um, very clear and, and vivid basis. So the more we engage them, the more we learn. And then we get okay. those confirmations so, on a regular basis. Okay. So how do, do they, how do they um, like, physically manifest, like, a like fire or smoke, because sometimes you see things, you hear things, you you know, you're just not sure. Right. So, and that's the that's the um, important piece about a consistent communication. Sometimes spirit possession takes place. Sometimes they will show themselves. If you're a little clairvoyant, you can see them standing there. You can see it a little bit more faint. They will manifest like that. Sometimes they won't manifest. They will manifest more in a faint way, and the reason okay. why, because they know how conditioned we are, that if they fully manifested more in more vivid colors, we would be frightened because we've been so conditioned oh. to be frightened. So they manifest very faintly until we get accustomed to that. Then they get a little bit more vivid as we become more comfortable with seeing. You know, if you're used to being in a house alone and you see something else is in the house, you know, you've been, you've been watching scary you movies since you were a kid and everything else you've been conditioned to, you know, react in a fearful fashion, and they understand that. So they'll be very faint, and they'll get closer and closer. They're, they'll come more vividly in dreams because they know you're not too fearful of that. But when they show up like that, you know, they'll take their time. Sometimes they'll do it through, you know, you burning incense and the smoke manifest. Sometimes they'll make things happen in the house and things like that. But the way to discern between who's who, who's a spiritually cultivated ancestor or ancestor, so one who's not, and who's communicating and who's not is engaging them on a regular basis through the shrine. The shrine helps to repel the more negative ones and the ones who are just kind of wayward, and then you can attune to the ones who are grounded. Because you, just like we were talking about the other night with regard to a baby, when someone has a newborn baby, this is their first child, all the cries sound the same, but as they attune to the child on a daily basis, they can start to determine, even if they're in another room, when a child cries, they can tell the difference between this is a cry for pain, this is a cry because they need to be changed, this is a cry because they're hungry, this is a cry because they're sleepy or uncomfortable. A parent can just mm -hmm. attune immediately. And somebody else in the room, all they hear is crying. They're like, what's going on? But the parent can say, oh, no, they're hungry. Or, oh, no, that's not that. It's, you know, they can tell because they, they're in tune with the child. And the same thing, with, the more you engage in Samantha, you can see there's a difference between the way and not know in Samantha, their energy is when they come into the space and how they communicate as opposed to somebody who's not 
harmoniously or, or, or guided or spiritually cultivated. No different than people physically. There's a difference between somebody who's mature and the way they communicate with you and operate and interface with you to somebody who's, you know, on drugs or something or they're kind of disordered and kind of emotionally unstable. You can feel the disordered energy coming from them, even if they're trying to put on a good face, you know, something wrong with them. Mm-hmm. But the people who are grounded and focused, they have a different kind of energy emanating from them. And you'll notice the difference. The more you engage, the more receptive and sharp you become with your receptivity, you notice how, how the, the nanonomen samaf will come, the spiritually cultivated ones come, and how their energy feels, and the ones who are a little bit, you know, disordered or unstable, how they feel. But it, it's, it's about consistent um, communication, trying work, and so forth. You begin to notice the nuances of, of their expressions. So then, um, so then this could be like, um, well, I guess like obvious and overt um, requests from us as to who we wish to be in contact with. Let's say it again. You said it can be. Well, when you say, well, we could um, repel the ones that are, um, you know, that are, you know, are negative. Um, um, I was just thinking then if we um, just overtly just ask that we only want to be in contact with, you know, the ones that are virtually cultivated, um, that would be an indication for those to show up. Exactly. And, in fact, and that's very important that you said that because in the English language there's no such thing as a spiritually cultivated ancestor ancestor. They don't have a term for that because they don't have any because white people don't have spiritually cultivated ancestors as an ancestor. But in our ancestral languages, there are specific terms that give so a basic prayer when you say na na no unsamampo, that collection of sound vibration, you're only evoking the na na no unsamampo and not the unsamampo bani or the spiritually discordant ones. When you use those specific prayers, you are specifically evoking that class of ancestral spirits, and you're saying it deliberately, saying you only want these to come forward, and you're repelling the other ones. And even the intent, even if you didn't know the language in and out, or even if somebody was deaf, you know, and they couldn't speak, the intent is always you only evoke those who are spiritually cultivated, who have been assigned to you to to help you in your development. You do not have an obligation to, and you do not evoke those who are spiritually unstable, self-destructive, and all of that. Some of these people talking about spirituality, they're like, well, you, you know, you talk to your ancestors, you talk to your spirit guides, and you talk to everybody, and you don't discriminate. That's nonsense. Like, I know. Only because, you know those like, who are spiritually grounded. Yeah, like I, I saw a video of, of a woman that's a college professor, and she's having this ceremony, and then she says, well, um, one of the participants there evoked the spirit of a, oh, of a Spanish hold, hold lady. Hold on one second. And I Hold on one second. I just want to say um, for people, if you want to listen beyond 11 o'clock, you have a, a little bit over a minute to call in. It's going to cut off at 11 o'clock for people listening online. If you want to listen beyond 11, and we'll probably go just a few minutes beyond 11, you have to call in. This number is 646-787-8155, 646-787-8155. You have about a minute to call in. If you can't remain online, Get I say for tuning into the broadcast. Of course, we will post the archive you know, on YouTube by tomorrow. Um, please go to the website to support the Black Swan Life Movement, or if you'd like to purchase one or more of our 29 books, we have discounts on that as well, like the first seven books for $40 that will support the work that we are doing as well. So yet I say for that, we just want to let people know to call in. Okay, but you were saying that the, the professor was talking about Okay. Um, that we were supposed to um, be receptive to all the ancestors, including those from other ethnic groups, like um, they were evoking people from, like, American Indians, um, uh, Spanish people, because they believe that um, we are a mix. I mean, physically we are, but I thought that... Um, African ancestral um, religion was not supposed to be mixed with other cultural um, practices. 
Exactly, and it's not. So we have a bunch of fools and criminals out here misinforming our people. When these parasites invade and try to participate in our ancestral religions, it's like they tried to in ancient Kemet when the Greeks and Romans invaded. Their goal was to try to destroy the understanding of the tradition. It took them thousands of years to do that so that we would be self-destructive. So they start trying to infuse themselves and infiltrate the traditions, just like you have white people trying to infiltrate the Yoruba tradition in Akan and Bodun, the same descendants of the white Greeks and Romans and others who tried to invade and insert themselves into the tradition in ancient Kemet. So they will try to get you to begin to invoke or evoke their deceased criminal relatives. Even though our blood circles get polluted to a certain extent during enslavement and, and some brainwashed Negroes who are marrying you know, non-black people and they pollute blood circles, those people that they copulate with and then they have children and so forth, those people are invaders. They are not our relatives. Like if, if you have a, if an ancestral spirit is watching their descendant go and marry a, a white individual and that ancestral spirit is drawn into the womb, you know, through that union because their descendant was engaged in foolishness, they were an ancestral spirit when they were watching their descendant move towards that white individual. They tried to stop them, but they didn't do that, so they forced that ancestral spirit to be drawn through and have a quote-unquote white parent. But before they even came into the womb, that white individual is an alien. That's a stranger. And everybody, every white person related to that white individual is alien to this ancestors watching this take place. So when they get drawn into the womb and born and they come out with a biracial body, they are really the ancestor of that black parent who's been with that black quote-unquote parent ever since that little parent was a child before they grew up and were able to have a child. They're an Afurakani or Afurakani ancestress. Their white quote-unquote parent is not their real parent. That's an alien invader, and every white person related to them is not their cousin. They're aliens. So you don't evoke those criminals and bring them into your family. You repel them. So it doesn't matter. The only spirits that we invoke, deities, of course, we invoke the divinity, the forces of nature, but the only ancestral spirits that we actually have are our Afurakani, Afurakani ancestresses and ancestors. Everybody else is a criminal invader. If somebody invaded your house and tied you up and threw you in the basement and was running the house for a year, once you got free, you wouldn't say, well, you live in the house now, you're part of the family. No, you would kill them. You would repel them. They're not part of the family just because they invaded the house. If somebody pollutes the blood circle yeah. and a little criminal spirit invades the blood circle and creates a flimsy connection. They are invaders, but they are not part of the ancestral family. They're not part of our clans. They're enemies. So you, we never pour any libation to any white Hispanic, white pseudo-Native American, or just Asians that have invaded this hemisphere and wage war against the black people who are already here. So they are not native to anything. They're not earth people. They're white Asian criminals. White Asians, white Hispanics, white Latinos, white Europeans, white Americans, white Hindus, white Arabs, these are invaders. And, of course, in India, there was an original black population and white people invaded and polluted some of their blood circles. So the further south you get in India, the darker the people get. The further north you get, the lighter they get because they're, these are the descendants of those, you know, you have black people still in India which most of us never see because they don't have the funds to come over here. But the ones that we see that are coming from India are typically, you know, the descendants of the white invaders. And when they pollute the blood circle, they are not our people. So we never include them in any ceremony mm -hmm. other than to repel them. And, of course, you know they're trying to get well, us to worship their people. But, you know, I think given that we all um, – were born into different religions that were not African ancestral religions, we don't really have a working knowledge as to what the worship should look like, what the prayer should. You get what I'm saying? So everybody right. kind of does their own thing. And, you know, we don't really have a place of worship to begin with. So um, when everybody's doing I'm saying it kind of does get polluted. Right. And, so, and that's, that's part of this whole notion of, as we talk about Etchi sign, which means ancestral religious reversion. And of course, we have our 
actually sign conference where we bring our people from different traditions together to present on different expressions of the culture. It's about reversion, ancestral religious reversion or restoring our ancestral religious practices, ritual practices, and inclusive of, you know, different people are getting turned back onto ancestral religion. They're connecting, connecting different communities and reestablishing these practices for themselves as well as their children and other people in their clans and so forth who are open to getting back involved. So, yeah, the part of the process was for them to try to destroy all vestiges of the tradition and make us fearful of embracing it. But our people are returning to our traditions and getting rid of these fake traditions. So we're rebuilding. I mean, even people that we know that were born on the continent, they, to me, seem more European than Europeans. You know, a lot uh, of them, of them yes. uh, are not true. They're not truly, like, ancestral. They, you know, they're very much into you know, you know, European religions and European practices, and they look at you strange when you talk about, you know, ancestral practices. Right. And many of them, you know, they're fearful of their own traditions. They've been conditioned to believe in the fictional cartoon character Jesus and Muhammad and Allah and all of that. But then we also have people, for example, we talk about Akanto Nanason. We have a number of Ghanaians who are learning about Akan and such religion because they will say that when they were at home and they, some of them are still on the continent, they're like, nobody practices where I'm at because they're scared of it. And I've learned more from you all over here in America about my own Akan religion right. than I've learned, I ever learned growing up in Ghana from my family. And they're starting to reestablish Akan religion in Ghana, in their clans, and, you know, creating, you know, this, this uh, repulsion for these fake religions. Christianity and Islam and everything else is going to fall and be destroyed on the continent. So we're part of that process here as well as there. So it's already beginning to crumble. We're just going to accelerate that process. But we're in that process now of destroying these fake religions. That's why we put the cuckoos and tomb out, proving that Jesus and Moses, Muhammad, and all these characters never existed, and put that audio book free online as well as the, as the book that people can read. So people around the world are studying that and, and rejecting these fake religions every single day and returning to their traditions. So we're well, in the I mean, midst of that, that movement. It's been around, it's been around what, 2,000 plus years, but yet there are at least maybe 2,000 plus different denominations. And my personal opinion was, is it that people are morally bankrupt or there's not much to it? <laughs> because every time you turn around right. and in certain neighborhoods, there are literally like five churches in one square block. You know, so it right. can't be that the people are morally bankrupt and they need more more and more churches. It's just that they're probably not finding what they're going there for in the first place. Right, because at the end of the day, there's nothing there because the little deity they're talking about never existed. So all they're doing is just following rules to worship the white narrow spring and engage in self-hatred. So people you know, they start asking questions, and now we have these answers that people didn't have before. Like, you know, before we put the cuckoos and tomb out, nobody knew that Muhammad was a fictional character, and we can prove where they stole that from in ancient Gamet. They didn't know Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael and Solomon and Sheba and Jesus and Allah, fictional characters, and Brahmin and Buddha, and we can show where they stole names of deities from Gamet and manufactured these little characters and stories. So now that people have information, they're dropping that nonsense. And it's just gonna it's just gonna expand. The more we put that information out, people all around the country and different parts of the world are already embracing and it just stimulates a, a, a movement. It's just like a tuning fork. If you make one oscillate, then another tuning fork near will begin to oscillate at the same frequency. When we get on track, people will feel that people who are connected to us, of course, our black people around the world begin to be stimulated by their own ancestors and ancestors to get back involved in their traditions and reject these fake traditions, and they will be emboldened to do so. They will no longer operate out of fear like they've been doing. So that's, that's part of the process. My last question, when is the movie going to come out? Um, so that was, that's another thing we should have mentioned. So we're, we're still working on that process. What we're trying to do, um, the goal is to complete the, at least the filming process within the next 30 to 40 days. We, we, 
we have the capacity to do so. Um, there was a slowdown in some of the fundraising effort. We're at like 46% right now. So okay. if we can get that support, we'll be able to knock the rest of that out by within 30 days, and then we go through that post-production process, and it could be done within, you know, at the latest within 60 days. So it just kind of okay. depends on, you know, the support from the community. So and what the sister is talking about, if you go to our website, we have Amaru Kapo Adebise Adjumade, which is African-American Ancestral Divination. This is a documentary film that we're working on. We first talked about the information back in January. We posted the information. We created a trailer that people can watch. And we're going to have a, you know, you'll see the details, but if you'd like to support the work, anybody listening, um, we're at about 45%. And we have lost like over $4,000 in a tax offset with the IRS, which has never happened before um, this, this year, which threw us back. So we had to try to recover from that because that, that would have put us over the top so we could finish things up. So we had to start all over with regard to that. So, um, but if people would like to support, you can go to the fundraiser page on our website, on the fundraiser website, but you'll see the link on our page, on our Facebook as well, to support that process. But we're we're making strides towards that. Well, I thank you for your information, Merase. Okay, Yeni Aceda. We appreciate the call. Okay. So, all right. So that was the last call. We're going to end the broadcast here. It's eleven twelve. So, again. Um, when you go to the website, we're Crazy Akan on Facebook. It's also Ojirafo Akan on Facebook, Ojirafo on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We're going to post this broadcast like we do the other ones on our YouTube channel. Uh, but when you go to the fundraiser.com page, that's F-U-N-D-R-A-Z-R.com slash Amadokafo underscore Adebisa. But you'll see the link on our different places on our website. You can contribute to the crowdfunding effort. We don't receive funds from any other institutions. It's totally funded by the community. We are, are at 45%, 45 or 46% of the funding effort. We started that back in January. And as we said, we, we had planned to be able to have it you know, done because of the tax refund that was coming, but because of student loans and things like that, for the very first time, they just decided to confiscate the entire thing. So uh, we're working on that, you know, raising those funds and recovering. So you can go to the crowdfunding effort, and once we get the requisite funds, we'll be able to complete the filming process and post-production, and we will be able to release the film within months. Okay, we have one more call. We're going to go to the phone line. Uh, Michiawa on the phone line, number 4255. You had a question or a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, how you doing, boy, Crazy? Good. How you doing? Pretty good. Uh, I had a question uh, uh, about when uh, in the book of uh, Coming Forth by Day, when uh, when Rod turned into the cat and uh, he killed Apel in the front of the tree right there on that picture, in front of that tree. I was wanting to know. Right, and the serpent is in, in kind of like a circle and cutting the head off. Yeah. I want to know, is there a connection with the knife and the tree and about, you know, the killing of Apep and all that right there? Okay, so you will have, um, and this is kind of associated with uh, one of the questions the sister asked. Sometimes when you have the cat, you can have a cat, which is regular feline, or you, have, you can have a big cat which is, you know, lioness or a lion. Um, in this context, when they're talking about the knife, sometimes they're talking about weapons that we use to kill. Sometimes we said it as well with regard to Ra and Riot. Um, utilizing the sun as a, you know, instrument, shooting out those spears or those sun rays or those knives to cut and burn and so forth. You have, and you see this on nature shows as well, Sometimes you'll see a lion or a lioness, and they're in battle with a 
cobra who are in battle with a serpent. And the way that they win the battle with the serpent is not sometimes eventually they end up fighting the serpent, but typically the first way that they, you know, take control of that serpent is with their knives because they have retractable claws. When the claws come out, they can rip and tear and rip the serpent apart, and that's how they defeat, you know, the serpent. So they utilize their, quote-unquote, knives that are in their hands, which are the, you know, uh, uh, the claws. So in that sense, when they're talking about the cat utilizing its claws to, you know, protect against that noxious serpent. Now, the tree, um, typically... When you're looking at those trees, whether it's the Ished tree or the the other um, Nehet tree, you have certain divinities who are connected to the trees. One of them is Nuth. He's a major divinity who will be connected to that sacred tree. But then you also have Het Heru in the sacred sycamore tree um, in the spirit realm. So you'll see them feeding the Ba and the Ba'at of the individual the divine the Bible, the divine living spirit, you see Newt or Het Heru feeding the Bar of the Bayat and the Bind of the of the person is inside the tree and they're receiving that divine uh, fluid or nutrient from uh Het Heru or Newt and that gives them that replenishes them as a Ba or a Bayat, meaning it replenishes them as a spirit, meaning it replenishes their divine living energy, their life force energy. The life force energy is that solar power that gives you vitality to function and act and work and everything, but it also gives you that vitality to kill your enemy. And you have that tree there. You have Het Heru or Newt, you know, and, and of course Newt is the atmosphere. Sometimes she'll take up residence in that tree, but you'll see her bent over um, Geb, the earth crust, She's the atmosphere, and in that context, they'll say that she, in the sky, she gives birth to the sun in the morning, and Ra is operating through the sun, and Ra gives birth to Ra in the sun in the morning, and then she swallows the breeze in the sun at night, and you see the boat of the sun sailing through her body to sky from sunrise to sunset, and she swallows the sun at night, but she gives birth in the morning. So, But the sun rays shine through her body and she mediates the sun rays as the atmosphere, and she directs the sun rays and so forth. So you have that tree. Newt is operating through the tree. She's feeding the energy of the bond by it, the solar energy of the bond by it, the divine living spirit. Now that you have that divine living spirit energy, powerful, energized, renewed, and so forth by Newt or Het Heru, now it can be used to claw to death that serpent, pull out those knives or those claws and, and rip that serpent apart. So that's that's what's happening in that section. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, something else. I'm listening to uh, the work you did uh, on Sashat and Tahuti. That what you did the other day. It was some good work. But I had a question about uh, Sashat and uh, the palm the palm uh, tree staff that she carried. I, th- I don't know if it's right. like you know term- terminology. But um, right. I seen uh, I seen the guy uh, the guy Hugh. The guy Hugh carries that too. So is it a connection with them those two or what you said which one which one? You said which one carried? Uh the guy Hugh. The Hugh. Oh, okay. So you're talking about are you talking about okay, so you're talking about the deity and he has both of them well sometimes he has one, but sometimes he has one in both hands. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, I so see Shaq, I see Shaq Curry, one of those two. Right, so that's the palm frond. So she and Tahuti has it as well. So when Sashat and Tahuti, they they have their pen, and you see they're checking the notches on the palm frond. They have their pen connected to the palm frond because it's enumerating the years of life of the individual. You see the deity Heku, um, also pronounced Huku, which deals with eternity and boundlessness and everlastingness and so forth, that that's the vital expansion and contraction of breath that's constant within the great divine body of supreme being. He's holding two palm fronds, one in each hand. He represents the eternity and, uh, of life and creation, a portion of that eternal expansion and contraction breathing apparatus, a portion of that is taken from him 
and place within the body of a person so we can expand and contract or breathe in and out. Hehu, hehu. Because breathing is hehu, hehu. So there's a male deity, hehu, female divinity, hehu. We can expand and contract eternally, nonstop, whether we're awoke or asleep throughout the entire um, breadth of our lives until it's time for us to make transition. As long as we're living, that eternal, boundless, everlasting expansion and contraction, hehu, hehu, that eternity of, you know, vitality is, or breathing is constant. So he's holding the palm fronds, showing that he's the one dealing with eternity or nonstop everlasting movement or life within creation. And those palm fronds represent the, you know, the life of the individual. But to Houthi and Sashat, they have their pens and they're counting this year, this year, this year, this year, and determining what should be happening within each year based on the name that we're given and how we should function. You see our names inside of a Chenu or a Cartouche. carries a certain uh, certain configuration of energy, so our lifespan is counted. We have a destiny. We have a certain years of life. If we execute our function in creation, we can fulfill that certain amount of years. If we don't, then we'll shorten the years of our lives. But if we do, then we'll have that length of years. And they count off those years and show what we should be doing and what we haven't been doing and so forth. So that's the connection between the two. Palm front itself has to do with our, our, our life, our, you know, um, existence. And then there's a finite existence that's taken into account. We have a little portion of hehu and hehu inside of our bodies that everlasting breathing apparatus that keeps us alive. And so Houdin and Sashak can count and enumerate and show what we should be doing with that, with that life time that we have. Okay. Okay, oh, uh, okay, thank you. One last thing, though. Uh, speaking of Tahuti, uh, you were talking about the connection with Tahuti and uh, the I-5 uh, divination system. Uh, right. Have you ever heard of, uh, you ever heard of the DAFI divination system? Is that, how does that play? You said DAFI? Yes. Right, so that's that's what um, that's the Yoruba system. So what they'll say is Dafa, meaning cast Ifa. That's what they're saying when they say Dafa. So the divinity, the system is called Ifa, it's called Afa, and you know Ibo, Ifa, and Yoruba, and Fa and Bodun. When they say so and so cast Ifa for so and so when they're reading the Odu Ifa text when they're engaged in divination. The da fa is the casting of fa, or the casting of the fa. So that's that's another title for the system. Okay. Well, I, I didn't know if it was the uh, like a female aspect. You know what I'm saying of it or whatever. So I just wanted, yeah, just wanted to know. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, brother. Uh, Manasse Hotel, and uh, thank you for everything. Okay. Any I said, I appreciate the call. All right. Okay. All right, so we have, we're going to take one last call, and then we'll be um, done for the broadcast. Uh, hold on one for a second. Um, Michiawa on the phone line, number 9440. You had a question or a comment? Michiawa, brother Kwesi, um, I, I'm just picking back in off of the gentleman just uh, hung up about talking about Tahuti and Sashat. One of the questions that I had is, um, I noticed the association with Sashat in the palm tree, but none, none of the literature I've read has made any connection to coconut. And I was just wondering, because I know there are different, obviously, species of, of plant as it relates to the palm tree. I wanted to know if there's a connection there, you know, just for uh, purposes of, of going to the shrine and, and things of that nature. Um, is is there a connection as it relates to the coconut, the scent, and, and energy associated with coconut? Oh, yeah, it is. So, And that's why you'll see, uh, for example, because I, you're right, there are different, you know, um, species in different places. And, you know, like in America, like if you're in Florida or something like that, and they have palm trees and coconuts and everything. Um, medicinally, of course, coconuts have, you know, uh, regenerative uh, nutrients and everything for teeth and for bones and all kinds of stuff. Um, 
But spiritually, yes. So you see, for example, he was just talking. He just asked about Dafa and the Yoruba tradition, the Obiabata system of the uh, divining with Obiabata. They would use cola nuts and things like that on the continent. We get over here, um, not having cola nuts. What people would use is coconut. They would use coconut shells for the Obi divination. Um, you'll see the people use a coconut on a, a shrine for Eshu in the Yoruba tradition, and they'll break the coconuts and so forth um, for different ritual practices, um, chewing on the coconuts for for ritual practices as well as medicinally. So, yeah, it's, it's, but it's, with regard to divination, like you were asking, people throw Obi when they – typically in, in – in the Western Hemisphere, when they say they're throwing obi for divination, they're talking about coconut. When they talk about okay. obi on the continent, they're talking about cola nuts, but there was a shift over here. You know, we use what we had in the area, but it's used for divination. Yeah, I was one because uh, Sunday is my crowdite, and I went to the oil store, and I just was prompted to buy a coconut incense. And I, so I was trying to make the connection. So let me ask one more question. What's the parallel with Tahuti as far as, um, you know, I'm, I'm missing coconuts for Sashat, but is there a, is that scent kind of shared amongst them? Is there a different scent that seems to be more associated with Tahuti? Because I, I didn't pick up anything specifically a scent for him. So I'm just trying to just trying to balance the shrine, you know, as I'm invoking them and, and just wanted to make sure I'm not overlooking a specific um, sense or, or, you know, or energy associated with specific scent for him. No, it is shared because, and it's true, because you have, um, like in the book when we were talking about the um, connection between the uh, palm tree and things like that, um, when we talk about Abe, the palm tree, um, and the woman goes to the palm tree and asks about conceiving a child, and the palm tree says, yes, I will allow you to conceive a child, but this is what you need to do and understand when this child is born, how they need to operate and what they should do and so forth. So she, she's actually consulting Abe, which is the you know, palm tree, which is Suhudi operating through that palm tree, and mm-hmm. that's the connection. Uh, we, we mentioned that Suhudi is Abe in this context in our common tradition, the palm tree, and she's divining and consulting this spirit so she can have a child. Um, uh, every and phone tradition, fa is the divinity of divination, and fa is shown as a palm tree um, in the Bodun tradition. Then in ifa, in the Yoruba tradition, you have the palm nuts, the ikin, the palm nuts, and so forth. Um, that's all connected. So, yeah, there's there's a okay. definite connection between yes. both. That is that is very, very helpful. The coconut scent is the only scent I've ever liked from the time I was a child all the way up to now. So as I've been invoking Teshat and Sahuti, like I said on Sunday, I was just prompted to go and, and get the, the coconut incense, but I wasn't sure if I was making the connection. So um, I'd say for, for confirming that for me, what I was, uh, you know, hearing. Oh, okay, no problem. Man, I said, we appreciate the call. Okay. And like we said, especially over here, um, cola nuts are very popular, of course, in West Afrika, Afrika, whether it's the Yoruba tradition or the Igbo tradition, chewing the cola nut in different traditions in Cameroon and places like that. But once we come over here and we don't have access to the cola nuts, you know, we use what we have in this region of the earth mother's body, um, and our divination practices reflect that. That includes, for example, there aren't any possums in, in Ghana and so forth, that kind of marsupial isn't over there, but the possum is over here. The abosom directed us to utilize those possum bones for divination, so that's what we utilize, and it's, it is effective. So, yeah, you, you, you have more of that use of coconuts over here, you know, much uh, on a larger scale, more so than you would have, you know, in the same communities who were brought over here in, in their communities where they live now on the continent. All right, so just want to make sure we didn't miss anything. 
Okay, so, you know, I say we thank everyone for tuning into the broadcast. Yes, please go to the Amarukako Adebisa Ajumadi site for our documentary film. Support that if you would like to receive any books in return for your contribution donation. We appreciate that. What we've had since we started January when we first posted the crowdfunding effort, um, we found out about the uh, tax offset in like something like, um, I think it was like April or something like that. We realized we were losing the $4,000, which, which happened, um, and then we got to kind of start over um, since then. So since January, we've had, it's been about 90 people who contributed. You'll see that it says 150 or so donations, but it's about 90, 90, 91 people who contributed, but some people have contributed more than once. Some people have contributed twice some three or four times, a couple of people five times over the course of the past 11 months because they want to see the work getting done. So we've had about 90, 91 people contribute to the effort, the thing, and we're at about 45 or 46 percent. The other day when I checked, it was 45 percent. So it's either 45 or 46. The thing is, even on our blog talk radio channel, when you click follow, we have a number of people who are following the channel, and that's why you receive emails, you know, the mass emails about when the next broadcast is. We have about 340-plus people who are following on Blog Talk. We have over 4,300 subscribers on YouTube. We have over 5,000 friends on Facebook, close to 1,000 friends or people signed up on um, Instagram, but even though some of those people are the same people, um, you know, uh, overlapping on these different social media platforms, one that's direct is the 4,300 people on YouTube, and many of you follow on YouTube, subscribe to YouTube. 4,300 people who, so far, we have 90 people, and some of those people have given once, twice, some three or four times. So it shouldn't just be on the 90 people. Uh, you know, to make sure that the whole film is funded. We have thousands of downloads of our free books on a monthly basis, about 4,000 downloads of our free books, uh, 29 books monthly. And, of course, people are listening to the broadcast and so forth. So out of that group, like we said before, awareness is one thing, but action is key. We could reach the, the rest of the 55 or 54% instantly tonight just by another 90 people making a contribution. Now, with 180 people, we could have reached that overnight. We often see we posted one thing. Somebody had posted a, a little video about um, spirituality, and it seems like, the you know, if you look in the universe, it's similar to the body, and it's like the organs and the body are connected to the different aspects of the universe. They were saying every single thing that we said in the cuckoo tum tum, and there was a couple of black people um, doing a little video and showing some images, they said everything we said in the cuckoo tum tum about the forces in nature being connected to the organs of the body and the cells, and they're, they're reflected and so forth. They put this little video together. It was a, maybe a five, ten-minute video, and they said, hey, we want to, um, put more videos out like this, but we really need your help. And they had a crowdfunding effort. Within a few days, they had raised like $54,000. Using information that most likely they learned from the Cuckoo Tum Tum, because we put the Cuckoo Tum Tum out 15 years ago in 13,002, so-called 2002, so it's been around and hundreds of thousands of people have heard it. It's been free online for, for over a decade, and it was the one thing that um, it was new when it came out, nobody was talking about Muhammad never existed and talking about the deities and the organs and the cells and so forth and putting it together in that fashion. So if those people can raise 50 plus thousand dollars in a few days, we've been at this for over a year. We've just had 90 people so far who were serious enough, committed enough to actually um, give. This is one of those things. We need to actually focus on doing what we say we're going to do. So we have to focus, connect with the individuals who are serious so we can get the work done. We have to overcome that paraplegic 
nature of awareness and marry movement action with awareness. So out of the 4,300 people we have subscribed, we definitely have more than 90 people out of 4,300 plus people who can contribute. If you look, have you supported a black business today? If you haven't, then you can support a black business today. If we do not support black businesses daily, then by default, we're supporting our enemies. So we need to get beyond that. So you can go and you can see the piece on, online, um, make a contribution to that effort, and we can get this film completed and impact hundreds of thousands of our people, eventually millions of our people. So again, Yedase, we thank you for tuning into the broadcast and the people who have been supporting that work and making contributions and so forth. And Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. Heads up.